So perhaps you can Should I start. should I get get started? Yep. Yes, uh, Ferai just I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to rush that, anybody, uh, you know. <laughs> Ferai just wrote to me that there's something wrong with her, her printer and uh, she has to go out and print uh, her talk and maybe late for the first session, but I think, okay, there is time. So we can, if, if you agree, we can start. Uh, I just check. I think we should, uh, we should start because I have seen that, uh, I mean, it's always, uh, Hello, it Elena. takes more time with a high, with a discussion, so. Yeah, well, let's start. I checked that and there's no panelist by mistake. So we can, yeah. Okay, well, first I have to find, uh, find our paper. Uh, uh, let me, while Cornell is looking for our paper, let me say that um, we wrote this together during COVID. It is uh, sticking <laughs> together some long emails that we exchanged asking one another questions. And, and long uh, telephone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I asked him to read it all together because it's not possible to disentangle what each one of us wrote. And uh, I decided it's best for him because he's the native speaker and he can do a faster, cleaner job. So here we are. Well, I don't know whether I can do a faster, cleaner job, Maria, but uh, <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. It's This is very much something that has been developed um, entirely cooperatively. And for the, uh, the written version, thanks to Maria for actually putting all of these email discussions and her notes, which she assiduously takes together uh, because during COVID times, I would not have been able to do that. Uh, okay. Um, can I introduce you? Not that, you know, you, <laughs> not, that either of you need introduction. So, um, today, um, in the, in our session, the, the first, uh, paper is by Cornel Fleischer and Maria Mavrudi. Um, I mean, I guess neither of them need introductions, but, um, here we go. Um, so, Professor Fleischer is Kanuni Suleiman, Professor of Ottoman and Modern Turkish Studies at the University of Chicago. And Professor Mavrudi is a professor of history at, U at UC Berkeley. Um, professor Mavrudi has written extensively on dream interpretation and the occult sciences um, in the Byzantine and the post-Byzantine settings. And Professor Fleischer, um, you know, everybody, a book that all of us has read, and I think it was uh, republished as a classic recently, uh, his book on Mustafa Ali, Bureaucrat and Intellectual. He has published also on um, Abdurrahman El-Bistami, and most recently, he was one of the editors of Treasures of Knowledge and Inventory of, um, of the Ottoman Palace Library with Gudru Nejipoldo and Jemal Kafadar. So, thank you. Thank you, Harun. And... Uh... And thank you, Maria, and thank you, Marinos, and everybody else for inviting us and accepting our, I suppose, somewhat unusual proposal. Uh, the way this began was actually when I had finished. Thank you for mentioning it, Harun. Uh, I just I had, I had finished a, a, a short piece introductory piece for the Treasures of Knowledge volumes uh, on Abdurrahman al-Bistami and, uh, and his classification of the sciences. And it just suddenly hit me. So I called Maria, of course, my dear friend. I said, <laughs> Maria, do you have anything like this in the Byzantine arena? Uh, now, and of course she looked around and uh, she found some stuff and we found ourselves with, uh, with a delightful joint project which threatens to uh, extend and extend and extend uh, about the intersection and interaction of early Ottoman and Byzantine intellectual history. So here goes. Uh, so our title is Ottoman Byzantine Classifications of Knowledge in the 14th and 15th Centuries. Uh, Abdurrahman al-Bistami, 1380 to 1454, was a leading Ottoman intellectual. Uh, just check the time. Okay. 
during his lifetime, lifetime and an important influence on subsequent generations of Ottoman scholars, which I could not restrain from myself. I could not refrain from uh, mentioning several times yesterday in our discussions. Uh, the most evocative testimony to the multiplicity of identities that Bistami and his age could contain is provided by his own sigla, Abd al-Rahman al-Hanafi by Sunni legal right, al-Bistami by mystical affiliation, and his persistent address to Sufis and letrists, uh, Sufis and letrists, both in capitals, as the brethren of purity and friends of felicity, uh, an international network of intellectuals who sought vigorously to renew, perfect, and universalize through the cultivation of knowledge of the cosmic order, religion and social order constituted by extant monotheisms. For Bistami, who admired in quotes, and I can't tell if you can see me, but uh, Greek learning and gnosis above all, he said, the Greeks had it all. <laughs> yes, the Arabs had some stuff and the, the, the Chinese had some stuff and the Indians had some stuff, but the Greeks really had it all. Just one of the reasons that I called Maria about this. Uh, and that in the multi-confessional environment of the Ottomanizing wild west of Islam, a term that I will claim credit for, uh, uh, although I told Nikolai Antov he was welcome to use it and he liked it a lot. Uh, his brethren included the, the quote, virtuous and learned of the Christians, unquote. And almost certainly his contemporary Platon died 1452, labeled erroneously by modernity as, quote, the last of the Hellenes. While his letrism would seem to join him to his near contemporary, the Khurufi Fazullah of Astarabad, executed for heresy 1394, whose messianism and incarnationism produced a new religion, Bistami absorbed the messianic es esotericisms of his day, age, it, for example, it is he who created the prophetic image of the monist mystic Ibn Arabi, died, died 1240, the mystic's greatest teacher, whose works are blamed for so much of the messianic tumult of the 15th century. And Bistami domesticated them in the service of a non-revolutionary, but still kiliastic Islam as operative in Sunni as in Shi'i milieus, as well as in Christian ones. Not only was his legacy powerfully palpable in the Messianic 16th century, but he also played a direct and decisive role in creating the image of the Ottoman house in the person of his patron, Murat II, father of the conqueror, as the dynasty cosmically ordained to establish a universal millennial order containing and purifying all revealed religions. Al-Bistami's towering influence uh, <clears throat> means that it is important to illuminate his in intellectual genealogy. This, in turn, has the potential to illuminate the social and political context in which he was formed intellectually and which he helped to shape. His work titled Al-Fawah al-Miskiyya fil Fawat al-Makiyya makes a clear reference to Ibn Arabi's Al-Futuhat al-Makiyya. Uh, I don't have to elucidate that question. It's a voluminous treatise, approximately 400 manuscript pages, that presents a new diagram of the genealogy of sciences in the form of a tree. Uh, which is actually Razian, as in Fakhreddin Razi, rather than Avicenin, although to be sure, Ottoman scholars, starting from Tashkipruzadeh in the second half of the 16th century, ultimately went back to an Avicenin model. Al-Bistami's genealogy of the sciences made a substantial impression and beyond, even to the late 16th century, 
as is evident from the fact that Tashka Prizadeh and others still talk about. It. It's also worth noting, uh, and I want to emphasize this point, that his classification of the sciences mirrors that of the original, well, not only I, but Maria and I want to emphasize this. Um, his classification of the sciences, his Tosnif al mirrors that of the original Ikhwan Asafa, that is of Basra and Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, so the address to Ikhwan Asafa wa Khullan al Wafa is not merely rhetorical, no, it's real. Posterity, certainly in the late 16th century, was uncomfortable with certain features of Bistami's view on the sciences. He saw the sciences of letters, ilm al huruf as a summa, a compendium of all the main theological teachings of Islam, and something meant as basic instructional material for Islamic theology, for students of Islamic theology. This in spite of the fact that al-Bistami denounced Fazlullah of Astarabad twice. In addition, he asserted that pre-Islamic gnosis is just as licit as Islamic gnosis, citing Plato. And this is one of the reasons that I, I, I, I mentioned uh, to Tuna, I believe, yesterday, uh, the the structure of the treasures of knowledge or the Fehrist al Qutub of uh, Mullah Hatufi in early 16th century Istanbul. Uh, in Al Fawah al Muskiyya, uh, which is really a Tasnif al Ulum, a classification of the sciences written around 1440 for Murad II. Uh, Al-Bistami complains gently of those who would question his authority or orthodoxy. Maria, give, please give me a sign as my uh, co-host here uh, if I'm running over time. No, it's fine. Go uh, on. <clears throat> in spite of these complaints, which were voiced while Istami was still alive, it was clear that during his lifetime, he was close, considered closer to the mainstream than to heresy, since he was instrumental in crafting imperial, Ottoman imperial ideology before 1453. The issue that puts him at risk of heresy is clearly hurufism. Uh, and it's a term that he does not use himself. It's, you know, he, his buddies are... Uh, Ahlul Khuruf or Ahlul Harf, uh, which is glossed in Ottoman historiography as an aberrant fling of Prince Mehmet five years after Bistami had composed this work. But it was in fact central to Ottoman formation. Indeed, his tree of the sciences was so powerful it, that it is recognizable, as I mentioned yesterday, in the organization of the Imperial Library Inventory of 1503-1504. Additional evidence that Bistami's classification counted as, quote, orthodox rather than, quote, heretical during his lifetime comes from Ahmedi's Iskendername. Ahmedi, who lived between 1334 and 1413, a somewhat older, belonged to the same environment as al-Bistami. They both sent, spent considerable time in Bursa and were con connected with the circle of Mullah Fenari, who is deemed by Tashke Prusade the first Ottoman Sheikh al-Islam, although there was very little that was Ottoman about him. <laughs> he goes off to Karaman for a whole bunch of years, for example. Uh, when he doesn't like what's going on after 1402, after the Battle of Ankara. So the Zagreb manuscript of Ahmedi's Iskender Name, for which I am debted to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Serpil Baju, whom some of you know, she said it to me, she said, oh, what do you make of this? Uh, 
she's just working on illustrated versions of the uh, of Ahmedia. Uh, this one dates from approximately 1431. It has two tables of contents. The second table of contents guides the reader through the manuscript and cites particular verses on particular folios from which one can learn about specific sciences pertaining to the stars, to medicine, uh, you know, astral sciences, to the science of letters, you name it. It clearly presents analogies with Bistami's classification. The currency of this classification in formerly Byzantine lands around the late 14th and early 15th centuries requires us to ask whether it owes anything to its contemporary Byzantine intellectual traditions. Bistami's close contact with Christian intellectuals, as well as his respect for uh, Hellenic wisdom, as he terms it, uh, which these Christian intellectuals clearly possessed, also prompt the question. Byzantinists, and here we pass to Maria's uh, prose, have not probed Byzantine classifications of knowledge beyond asserting the longevity of the trivium and quadrivium inherited from late antiquity. Even for Platon, Presumably, the star intellectual of the period, I mean, this was the guy who was you know, selected to uh, attend the Council of Ferrara Florence on whether or not the churches could, uh, could be combined amicably. Uh, we don't know much about uh, many aspects of his philosophy, that is Platon's philosophy. In general, Byzantine scientific and philosophical thought has not received attention from modern scholars because it is presumed largely not to exist. You know, as was you know, the case until relatively recently for the, uh, for the Ottoman counterparts in the first century and a half or two centuries of quote unquote Ottoman history. And I'll just throw in here, as Jaman knows and, uh, and Tunch knows, that you know, one of the things that emerged when I was writing the introductory, my introductory piece to the treasures of knowledge was that we can't really talk about you know, this period as Ottoman. You know, what is Ottoman emerges in the later latter part of the 16th century. We can talk about it as Ottomanizing, perhaps. Uh, at least that's the way I talk about it. Uh, so modern scholars have frequently used Byzantine and Ottoman literary culture in order to retrieve chapters of ancient Greek and classical Arabic thought. Therefore, in order to understand the position of the science of letters among the intellectual traditions of the Paleologan uh, Paleolo pe period, one has to investigate the manuscript tradition of Greek texts that belong to this tradition. One important Greek text that addresses the science of letters is, in, is entitled The Mystery of Letters. Surprise, surprise. Modern scholarship has explained that this treatise was produced in a monastic environment around the middle of the sixth century drawing inspiration from the Jewish tradition of inter interpreting the Hebrew letters, but at the same time maintaining a distance from it, the author presented a Christian interpretation of the Greek alphabet. The manuscript tradition of the Greek mystery of letters belongs entirely to the period between the mid 14th and the late 16th century. In other words, the surviving copies of this text were created exactly when the science of letters occupied a central position in the Ottoman political ideology, intellectual production, and Islamic spiritual practice. Uh, so for now, we'll just refrain from discussing the 16th century manuscripts of the mystery of letters, both because they post-date Bistami and because of the need to investigate whether they were copied in Ottoman lands or in Europe. 
However, the earliest among the, the, the surviving manuscripts, Parasinos, Greek 2314, dates to the 14th or 15th century and is therefore, therefore contemporary with Bistami. This manuscript is a miscellany that comprises more or less the same categories of knowledge that occur in Bistami and in Ahmedi's table of contents, medicine, alchemy. There you go, Tuna. Uh, astronomy, astrology, science of letters. This provides an incremental but certainly positive answer to the question of whether the Byzantines and the Ottomans in that period had similar concepts of how the sciences were classified. Yes, at least some of them did. And the choice of what topics to include in this manuscript demonstrates it. And uh, well, okay, I was going to add something in here, but uh, Cornell, we have uh, only four minutes left. Okay, just read uh, through as fast as you can. I'm doing it as fast as I can. Thank you, Maria. A further similarity between Paleologan and uh, early Ottoman literary culture concerns the philosophical importance of riddles. Tashke Prusade refers to works by Mulla Fenari which describe 20 sciences or fun in verse and in the form of riddles or puzzles, al ghaz Tash Kibruzadeh included this in his discussion of Fenari in the Shaqa'iq, where he describes his Fenari, as I mentioned a moment ago, as standing at the head of a specifically Ottoman scholarly lineage. Uh, probably the work has not been found, but Tash Kibruzadeh comments on it as something unusual or clever. This calls to mind the neo ikhwan safas fascination with Mu'amma, uh, to which Evrim Binbash drew attention uh, in talking about Yazdi's statement that Mu'amma Java is limited to proper names. This and the al ghaz reference calls to mind Bistami's only printed work, the Al-Manahaj of Tarassul. This is an ostensibly a epistolary. This is ostensibly epistolary, but also in verse and all couched in al -Ghaz. So as with the, cla the classification of sciences, then Adi also produced one and the Ahmadi copy from Zagreb, it's important to understand where there's an imtak, pardon me, an uptick in specifically Ikhwan cultivation of these genres and overlap with the Greek production indeed. Uh, Bistami repeatedly expresses admiration for Yunnan as fountainhead of philosophy and wisdom. The genre of riddles is very old, or, old in Greek, already embedded in ancient Greek poetry and myth. Byzantine intellectuals, especially those who have profound philosophical training, habitually collected riddles. This is well attested from the 11th century onwards. The foremost example is Selos, Michael Selos. But there are others too in every century. The best century, 10th century attestation is certainly the Greek anthology, the oldest copy of which dates to the 10th century. Uh, as modern scholarship has discussed, riddles are metaphors for the cosmos. And for this reason are connected with philosophy, including natural philosophy, especially of the Platonist variety. They're connected with wisdom literature. They function in courtly settings and are therefore, therefore part of a Greek equivalent to uh, the Arabic adab al uh, Oracular pronouncements are also versified. The Delphic or oracle was famous for producing such. The Arabic equivalent of lurs and ma'amma uh, are very old too. Uh, the earliest examples can be found in the poems of Abu Nuwas and Durrumma. Certainly, riddles are part of the ancient Greek and ancient Near Eastern rhetorical and edu uh, educational traditions, uh, and were part of the education of modern children in Europe, the Middle East, and elsewhere until recently. Until at least until recently, riddle books were given to children. Uh, riddles alongside. Fairy tales and singing were greatly appreciated as amusement at social gatherings. In general, pre-modern literary traditions in various languages demonstrate an equivalent regard for wisdom literature, metaphors in poetry, etc. That means that riddles circulated 
for several centuries around the Mediterranean and beyond. In the end, the question is not where they come from, they are everywhere, but what makes them so compelling in a 15th century Neoplatonist context. Uh, so, you know, here we have to pay attention to allegory as a philosophical instrument. Am I going to be able to get through this, Maria? And uh, skip to the conclusions, like the last couple of paragraphs where we talk about the Roman and the, uh, the Roman heritage in... Uh... Okay, which page, please? Um, I don't know your pagination now, but it was... 11? I guess, like the very end. Okay, hang on a second. Last, last page. All righty. Thank you for keeping track of me. Uh, I'll read the last two pages. Uh, two and a half. Uh, So while we're on the topic of Greek antiquity, it's important to point out Vistamis, uh, this will pick up from where I left off, uh, for Yunnan as fountainhead of philosophy and wisdom. This is, all, this is exactly the feeling that Paleologan intellectuals have for their ancestors. One of the most important 14th century intellectuals, politician and imperial father-in-law, Medochites, famously expressed it in the following terms, all the good questions have been asked, all the good answers have been given in ancient Greek philosophy and literature. All that remains for us is to rearrange the deck of cards. In his writings, Metochites is more optimistic about later intellectual contributions, but he, like the generation that trained him and the generation that followed, has a profound knowledge of the ancient tradition and constantly uses it as a point of Reference. Uh, furthermore, Bistami's predilection for ancient Greek gnosis must also be seen in the broader context of the late 14th and early 15th centuries, especially the popularity of Nasiruddin Tusi's reading program in the mathematical sciences, which called for a return to the ancient Greek authors, uh, which were known, who were known, of course, through Arabic translations but also through, through live informants. And this, I guess, is, you know, one of Maria and my, uh, one of our points here. Uh, you know, these are not separate worlds. What does all this mean for early Ottoman identity and politics? We suggest that the Ottomans are consciously using Roman imperial dignity and space in concert as well as in conflict with Byzantines. The military emphasis which is placed by certainly uh, both global and Ottoman historians, has obscured or occluded the shared intellect intellectual space, which was certainly there. Uh, these were very restricted circles. I mean, everybody knew who everybody else was. Uh, Bistami's circle was in constant contact with their brother brethren all over. Uh, to as far as Herat and Bukhara and Tabriz and Cairo, but also with Christians and Jews. Whether the story about Pletho and his Jewish mentor in, in Edirne is true or not, it points to an un underlying interest, in fact, implicit or explicit in the apocalyptic scenario of the ultimate purification of all religions and merging under the aegis of philosophy with one another. Uh, and as shown in the work of the late Angela Volan in the 16th century reception of oracles attributed to the 10th century Emperor Leo the Wise, the Orthodox were willing to emerge em Ottoman emperorship with Roman succession in the 16th century. Another example leading to the same conclusion is the life and career of Sheikh Bedreddin, who was both a pupil and a friend of Bistami's. It shows that a mixing of confessions and lineages was a well-known fact of life in Western Anatolia, Thrace, the Balkans. So much so that the Yazjul, a family of Gallipoli, in their numerous instruction manuals on, on which uh, Carlos Grenier has written so expressively, on what Muslim belie Muslims believe actually expressed an anxiety about how to set Muslims apart from the others, 
especially with so many recent converts. Uh, okay, Byzantine texts and interpretive approaches to ancient Greek thought informed both Ottoman and European thought in the early 17th century. This has further important implications regarding central issues in the modern study of early Ottoman history, intellectual history. Specifically, most modern analyses generally posit a dichotomy between rational and irrational approaches, uh, where rationalism is equated with Aristotelianism and irrationalism with Platonism. This approach to Ottoman history replicates early, earlier approaches to early modern European intellectual history. However, in that field, scholars have shown that pitching Platonism and irrationalism versus Aristotelianism and rationalism is a misleading oversimplification. So in our view, from the 15th into the 17th century, both in the Ottoman and European examples, one can detect a dialogue between Platonism and Aristotelianism. The combined reading of Plato and Aristotle in the extensive use of allegory are two of the most important and completely unrecognized intellectual legacies of Byzantium to both the Western European and the Islamic world. And I just, you know, as the symbolic Ottomanist here, uh, I would want to stress that. Uh, you know, Byzantium is very much a part of what founds the Ottoman Empire. It's not just the enemy. This provides a new lens under which to interpret Ottoman intellectual history instead of being characterized by a belated passage to modernity. One can view Ottoman intellectual history as essentially not very different from the Western European paradigm. Thank you for your patience. And thank you, Maria, for keeping track, sort of. Thank you. Um, so um, we will have people asking questions. And I think right now, um, Ganesh is the only person who has his hand up. So please, Ganesh. So thank you. It was fascinating. I have just a suggestion furthering a bit more to the Wild West and uh, suggest a cross lecture with Il Libro de Alessandria uh, produced in the court of King Alphonse VIII, which is contemporary of the Ibn Arabi. When I had read Iskander Name in comparison with the Il Libro de Alessandria, it was, especially for the epistemic perspectives, uh, they were quite, how to say, uh, not always in the same pattern, etc. but they have the same track of, uh, I don't know, getting from one, one point to another in the narrative itself. So it, perhaps this may as well highlight all these Mediterranean, dense European communion, let's say. Just it's a suggestion in any case. Well, thank you. Uh, and actually, I should pass pass the baton to to Maria. So, uh, what is the? So, this is which century? I I, I couldn't hear the the connection is not very good. So, can oh. you repeat the date and the language? Libro. I mean, is this uh, this sounds like Italian? But no, it's, did I hear it? It's it's cut in Catalan. It's in, written in, which in the century? in the thirteenth late thirteenth century. That's uh, sorry, it's late. The uh, 12th and the beginning of the 13th century. It's not uh, how to say. Mm -hmm. uh, the date is not clear, nor the author, but it's attributed to the court of King Alphonse VIII. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, of course, the Alexander story is a huge, huge, huge. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And there are examples in Greek uh, mm -hmm. that are you know, this is the mother story, of course, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to trace when when goes where, like what. Mm -hmm. All I can say, late 12th is a little bit early, both for the appearance of vernaculars in, yeah. uh, in Europe yeah. and uh, 
also a, a little bit early for the closest uh, Byzantine Catalan encounter that was to come in the 14th century. But so, perhaps, perhaps I think it was the Ibn Arabi reference triggered me. Because ah, okay. they are from the same yeah. milieu, I would Got say, it. which mm -hmm. would hypothetically, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, make some common ground, but it's just the, I don't know, suggestion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's valuable. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. Um, I have a question from Jane Hathaway. Uh, which has been typed, I'll just read it out. Um, did the Byzantines give early Ottomans and other Muslim states in the region direct access to Aristotle, given that during the Abbasid translation movement that what was thought to be Aristotle was generally Plotinus and other Neoplatonists? Um, thank you, Cornell and Maria, for a very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, did the Byzantines give early Ottomans and other Muslim states in the region direct access to Aristotle? Uh, hmm. um, This one's no. for you, Maria. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm trying to see how I can best answer it. Um, no, I mean, I, I think the, uh, the, the question is, is uh, um, complicated. I mean, it, it's more complicated than that. I mean, yes, the theology of Aristotle, which was a fundamental text for the Ihuan and the Neo-Ihuan, is Plotinus circulating under the name of Aristotle. At the mm -hmm. same time, there was an enormous amount of, of real Aristotle, much more than Plotinus or Plato circulating in Arabic. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that comes to mind directly at this, uh, around this period and a little bit earlier, so we are at the late 14th, early 15th century, is uh, when Emperor uh, Manuel II goes around and uh, be because he's now hostage to, I forget which Sultan, uh, but uh, basically he has to go and help the Ottomans besiege his own cities. Right. So he goes around in Ottoman lands that had been Byzantine lands and he talks about uh, uh, what he sees there. And then he talks about an encounter he has with the Mudaris uh, who comes from Persian lands, etc. And they begin talking about Aristotle. So Manuel writes down his impression that what kind of Aristotle is this? It's irrecognizable to me. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, but, uh, what I'm trying to highlight with this incident, which is one recorded incident, is that, uh, yes, they know what Aristotle is, they discuss it, uh, but they have, and they recognize they have very different interpretative traditions about it. And of course, the fact that they know it through, I mean, the, the Islamic world knows it through translation in which there is also interpretation is part of this uh, disconnect between the Byzantine version and the uh, Arabic Ottoman version of Aristotle. I, I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer, but there's a lot of Aristotle going around, the real and the concocted, and, the, and yeah. then the real is, is, uh, is interpreted and reinterpreted. There are many interpretative traditions. <clears throat> well, and this is one of the you know, instances in which your work, Maria, on, on Plato uh, seems to me to be so, so very important uh, um, because he's the guy who, in, uh, at least from the standpoint of Western European history and the traditional narrative about the Renaissance and the Medicean Academy and so on and so forth, is supposed to be the guy who kicks off the debate about, you know, is Aristotle better or Plato better? Uh, but among the white folks. Mm -hmm. And I think in general, we have not, uh, it, it is my opinion about the, how we approach the history of philosophy. It, I mean, uh, ancient hi historians of philosophy know this very well. Uh, please, I mean, uh, Plato and Aristotle were read together since antiquity. The idea that there's something separate right. effectively arises in the Renaissance among Italian scholars, and there's something political riding on it. It is mm -hmm. basically the independence of the Italian princes as opposed to the hegemony of the Pope. So in philosophical terms, if you 
uh, arrange this, um, this confrontation, you call the Pope an Aristotelian because of Thomas Aquinas, and then you call yourself a Platonist. And this has very uh, overt political uh, uh, coloring, so much so that Sigismondo Malatesta uh, took the body of Pliton, which was buried in Mistra, and reburied it in Rimini to assert his claim to the Platonic heritage. This is not an intellectual claim. It's more of a political claim. It's, yeah. it's, it's a call to the Pope to stop. So um, uh, we cannot read, uh, this is not Albistami's world. So if, if we do this, we read backwards. Aristotle is not synonymous to, with reason and Plato is not synonymous with illuminationism. Mm -hmm. And this is very clear when you read uh, philosophy in late antiquity and uh, philosophy as, as the Byzantines were reading it at, at the margins of their own manuscripts. Thank you. Uh, um, Professor Garak, um, can you, we, I think we can take a brief question. If I'm, I'm hoping you have a brief question. The question is brief. I don't know about the answer. So, okay. uh, since, uh, <laughs> uh, just as you said, uh, this is not uh, uh, the uh, Albistami's world. And in this world, in the wild uh, west of Islam, etc., you said, and uh, uh, if I uh, understood correctly, that uh, he was suspected of, uh, suspected of heresy or afraid of that. Uh, I'm not so, so certain if I understood you correctly okay. or not. Anyway, if this is correct, I mean, who would suspect him of heresy and on what basis? Who decided that what a person like in, in Albistami's, uh, Albistami, uh, his writings would be heretical or could have been heretical at that particular time, and I'm not talking about 17th century or later, but uh, uh, during his lifetime, and on, on what basis? Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer that very briefly, if I may. Uh, Harun, you can stop me Please. anytime. Uh, you know, it's not... There, there is in the 15th century, certainly in what become Ottoman lands, there is no sort of doctrinal authority. So Bistami mentions very sort of gently, he said, well, you know, the reason I'm writing this work, which is 400 pages, for Murat II, uh, is because there have been some guys who've been questioning the rectitude of someone who came, came to the lands of Rome, of Rum, uh, as a visitor. So I'm writing... Cornell, this. Cornell, Cornell, mention the, the, because we mentioned it in the paper, Fazlala Alastarabadi, had been executed for heresy right. using 30, the I same mean, intellectual instrument. 20, 20, so immediately, this reeks of heresy right there. And that was, and you know, and and and that was, you know, Timur or Timur's son actually, who did it, arrogating to themselves the authority to, uh, because Fazlullah Vastarabad was, after all, a social and political threat. As but in Astarabad, not in the Ottoman lands. Huh? Well, but, but it's all you know. It's all part, part of, of the same universe. the same universe, mm -hmm. and the scholars who are being attracted to Ottoman lands, and there aren't that many of them. I mean, Ottoman lands do not have much in the way of an educational system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody has to go to Cairo, or they go to Tabriz, or they go to Herat, or Samarkand. Uh, or they just travel around for um, their education. In Thrace, in Rumelia, not much. Okay. So the people who were to return to your question, 
the people the people who were intimating that al bistami because he's a, a member of the brethren of letrists is not kosher uh he is saying okay i'm going to tell you why i am a great scholar and i should be considered among the authoritative scholars of my age and it's not just the fact that i know prophetic tradition and so on and so forth i also know the gnostic tradition uh and he even go, goes so far i'll just add this I, we didn't put it in the paper he says there are two paths to illumination one is sufism and the other one is book learning and i i'm a member of a sufi order he's a member of the bistamiya which is a whole another kettle of fish uh says you know i just didn't have it in me to get illumination. So I took the other path. I took book learning. And here are all the books that I've read to the number of 230 or 240. If, if uh, I may. Yeah, please. Um, I just, you know, I, I, I love the free conversation, but uh, I have been tasked to kind of like keep yes, things yes, going. Yes, um, of course. Yeah. And I don't want apologies. to torment you. No, no apologies necessary. I, I apologize. May I suggest that we continue this discussion in the final session tomorrow and just have a, a very short five minutes break and go on because we have another promising uh, session promising to be quite long so <laughs> okay. and we'll, have, we'll have a whole session for discussion in the last uh, tomorrow uh, okay sorry marinos i just wanted to pose the question no no just uh, why is it so to, different to make i don't quite understand but i can tell that it is different no. shall we begin promptly uh, um, yes i think i should <laughs> excellent all right. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the second panel of the day. Uh, we have a slight change in our schedule. Uh, and so the order of our speakers, we will begin with Tunshan, continue with Peray Joshkun, and end with Jamal Kafadar. So our uh, first speaker, a dear colleague and ghost team member is Tunshan uh, from Columbia University. Uh, as well known to many of you, Tunch's economic uh, academic interests cover many different aspects of Ottoman knowledge production. Uh, and as a member of the Ghost Project, he is working on Ottoman astrological and divinatory material kept at European manuscript libraries. Um, thanks to his award-winning work, we are learning about Ottoman stargazers, timekeepers, and warriors from personal horoscopes in the marginalia to immense court projects. Uh, his talk today sounds fascinating, and let's hear about mystics versus munajims. Punch to you. Um, well, thank you so much, Asli. Let, for... let me add in here, Tunch uh, is my dear friend and my student. And I'm... I'm really humbled by these remarks. I mean, thank you so and, much. That's, that's uh, why I'm here. <laughs> Um, and thank you all in the audience for being with us today. And special thanks should also go to dear Marinos and his team in Retno for um, putting together such a wonderful program. Um, and it's been a great experience to share the past few days with the true experts of the things um, we discuss. And the issue of experts and expertise actually constitute the main narrative uh, of my presentation today. Um, as my title suggests, I'm going to speak of um, um, the 
the competition or the rivalries between different sorts of experts in um, the early modern Ottoman world. But of course, it's a very ambitious title. I should just say that I'll confine my remarks to 15th and 16th centuries, and I'm uh, begging to hear my dear colleagues' uh, comments and recommendations with specific reference to the 17th and 18th centuries. So let me just turn to my PowerPoint presentation, but I should first, of course, <laughs> share my screen, sorry. Okay, you can see, I believe, my um, Perfect. Perfect. now. Um, so for quite a while, I've been studying a particular group of experts, the Monegems, the things they wrote and studied, and the things written and um, reported about them, both back in um, their own days and also in more modern times. And I believe uh, expertise, more particularly the scientific expertise, is a valuable tool to frame the discussion, and I'll explain why. So the terms expertise and experts um, might sound too modern or anachronistic. Um, these categories are uh, discussed more frequently in the literature of sociology, political science, or even business administration regarding the industrial and post-industrial societies and polities as well as the role of experts in the governance. But the notion has also been referenced recently by some early modern historians of science in the European context in specific reference to the relations between scientists and um, the, uh, the early modern imperial formations. And I myself, I should say, have my own reservations and questions about the use of expertise as an analytical category. I mean, if we are to object to using expertise for being anachronistic or being elusive, then what are we going to do with the term science or scientists? Can we really speak of science and scientists in the medieval or early modern context? And how about such actors' categories, uh, some of which uh, featured in uh, discussions earlier, like alim and ilm, or hekma and hakim? What do these categories really capture in, um, in, to, to explain or explicate the relations of intellectual life in past societies? Are these categories um, less elusive than expertise? And it would be unfair to say that expertise or experts are just analytical or heuristic devices. When we browse past sources, we can easily identify particular terms used to mean expertise concerning expertise of concerning particular groups and professions. Hazet, for instance, was used almost exclusively to highlight the expertness of physicians, or mehre, referring to the comp competent practitioners of non-scholastic sciences like the sciences of SARS or, um, or navigation. And I put here some examples I um, encountered in some of the sources I, uh, I, I looked into. And there are additional phrases one could frequently encounter in, let's say, the Muhimma registers or the court records, such as ahl vukuf or ahl khibra or khabir. I mean, these latter categories are, of course, much vaguer, but they were used uh, certainly to refer to the expertness of individuals in question. Maybe we should further distinguish between different types of expertise to reduce the term's slippery nature. Because if we are to define experts as those individuals um, who know very well the things they do, then any skilled, experienced practitioner of anything could easily qualify as an expert of this or that, regardless of whether the person received specialized text-based training. However, if we add certain modifiers like scientific expertise or artisanal expertise or lay expertise, we may have a better chance of establishing some historical precision. 
And through especially the use of scientific expertise, we can also bridge the gap between the theory-oriented slash knowledge-based history of science studies and more practice-oriented scholarship. Because some of the particular groups like physicians, like the scientists of stars, or maybe even architects and engineers are known to have combined a robust textual and technical knowledge with more practice-oriented, experience-based knowledge. So the scientific expertise as a term offers some um, benefits to bridge such theory slash practice gaps. And we should, of course, also discuss how the expertise and experts were discerned at the time and by whom. I mean, there were undoubtedly self-proclaimed experts manifest more strongly in the appellations they chose for themselves. There were people calling themselves, for instance, Riyazi or Nejmi or Saati, um, just highlighting the type of expertise they, they held. But there were also other manners or agents or even credentialize, credentializing units, be it a vaguely defined public, be them one's peers or disciples or students in that profession, or be them the patrons, the decision makers, even the court and the administration that formally established one's credentials and expertise through uh, assigning them into particular ranks and documents uh, handed to them. And we haven't really looked into those accreditation mechanisms that the Ottomans practice through barats or the language used in the epistolography. So expertise is, I believe, um, I mean, with all due respect to my own reservations, uh, a great window into looking at professional rivalries and competing claims of authority and prestige, sometimes among different registers of the same expertise or profession. And I hesitate to frame it around a dichotomous low, high culture, low culture thing. Uh, but for some areas, and the science of the stars is one such area, there were a com complete distinction between the technical learned experts and practitioners of it and more lay, less technical practitioners of that science. So uh, expertise could allow us for making those distinctions within that particular expertise and also across different types of, types of expertise. And the story I um, would like to uh, narrate today, uh, the contention between the mystics and the monadjums is one such uh, episode of these competing claims over authority and expertise. Uh, So, um, as I said, I've been working on the Monedjims and the writings on them and writings by them for quite a time. Um, but I define Monedjims uh, not simply as astrologers or um, fortune tellers, but rather as a group of practitioners, specialists with the ability and technical know-how of the sciences of the stars broadly defined. Yes, they did fortune telling. Yes, they practiced astrology. But I think it would be pretty inaccurate and unfair to lump together all sorts of practitioners of divination um, and put them into the same basket. I mean, there were really important nuances that need to be expressed and acknowledged. Um, there is, of course, a vast literature in the medieval Islamic context and beyond on how monadjims and astrologers, let me use the term astrologers in this context, were attacked by different groups. Um, in the particular Islamic context, we have the fatwas of jurists, for instance, the most famous examples were um, the ones by Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Qayyim al um, We have a, a discussion in the Kalam text, we have a discussion and attacks toward astrologers in Adab and Akhlaq treatises. Chronicles and hagiographies and encyclopedias of sciences are replete with um, that kind of discourse. And interesting, the Futuwa treatises also often um, uh, identify Munajims as a particular group who should not be involved in the Futuwa brotherhoods. Um, 
But when we look more closely um, into the discourse produced through these texts uh, scattered across different genres, um, we see that the discussion is indeed more about the alleged claims, methods, and social identities of monadjims rather than the fundamental cosmological principles and premises underlying their science. In other words, it's really difficult to find in the medieval and early modern context someone who would not subscribe to the fundamental premise of astrology, i.e. the celestial realm, affects terrestrial events. And there is no doubt about it for no one. So what is the big deal then about the monadjums? So as I keep saying that this discourse, this, these attacks against monadjums uh, permeated into numerous genres and um, one could trace it in the most popular text of the time from the poetry of um, Rumi or Alishir Nevai to some medieval bestsellers like Shebusteri's Gülşen Raz. And this ubiquity of this uh, discourse and the attacks against astrologers makes this extremely difficult and maybe redundant indeed to historicize um, the discussion. I mean, of course, the proliferation of attacks in a place at a time is a strong sign of um, the greater appeal to those um, practitioners, the monadjims, or uh, the occult sciences in general in that particular context. And this is how some Mamluk and medieval Muslim historians read Ibn Khaldun's or Ibn Taymiyyah's attack as emblematic of the rise of occult sciences in that ter terrain. But I would like to really discuss whether we really need to historicize uh, this debate and we really need to just um, um, trace the particular historical contingencies of it. Um, so here are some examples um, from uh, the medieval bestsellers um, in which you can find a similar discourse on um, the nonsense produced by the monadjims. Um, um, Alishir Nevai also captures it. I mean, um, one is really spoiled for choice uh, to put examples here. So what I would like to do in the rest of my talk is just to show you some examples drawn from Ottoman sources in the late 15th and early 16th century, a period when we test efforts towards establishing or institutionalizing the expertise of Munejim's uh, through the office of Munejim Bashir. Um, while browsing these relevant accounts produced in late 15 and uh, in the first half of the 16th century, I've realized to my surprise that the most outspoken attacks toward the category of monadjums, I mean, the attacks are directed towards a, an impersonal category of monadjums instead of attacking a, a particular uh, monadjim um, uh, holding a post. So these attacks came from mystically inclined individuals and self-proclaimed sheikhs of different Sufi orders. And this is, I think, important in view of established convictions about Sufism as a or the form of Islamic esoter esotericism or about the Sufis as the practitioners par excellence of various occult practices. So what are we going to do with the Sufi attack on the monadjums, and what role might professional rivalries or socially relevant anxieties played in this discussion? So let me start with Sinan Pasha. He needs no introduction to the audience here, but he was a, a respected um, scholar, a mathematician, an astronomer, even a royal tutor uh, in the late 15th century. Toward the end of his life, he was initiated into the Sufi path at the hands of uh, um, Zaini Sheikh, Sheikh Bafa. And after his initiation, he wrote Sufi, he wrote texts in Turkish on Sufi ethics. And one of these texts is Ma'arif Name, where uh, Sinan Pasha weaves several issues uh, together um, that are important to conduct a pious life. Um, in both this world and hereafter. And he devotes one particular and significantly lengthy 
um, chapter uh, on a discussion on, on monadjims and the physicians. And the central argument in this relatively long passage is that in order to be an upright Muslim, one should pay no attention to the words of monadjims. God should be the only source of wisdom. Munajims are just fools to their claim to know the unseen. They worship celestial powers, but they fail to understand the, understand the real causes of influences. Sometimes Munajims draw a judgment based upon a particular celestial position, but then another configuration just rules out its effect and Munajims don't have authority uh, really over of predicting these kind of things. Uh, for Sinan Pasha, those who are straight in manner and sound in piety do not ever need a zij or takvim. As he underlines, this does not mean that the pious people deny the celestial influences upon terrestrial events. On the contrary, they are aware that all the generated things in the universe are dependent on one another. The world of generation and corruption runs on celestial influences. Even a death of a mosquito is affected by a particular celestial configuration. So Sinan Pasha tries to charge Munejims here with astral determinism and unbelief and pairs their craft with magic. But of course he does not and cannot question the astral causality which was the essential cosmological paradigm he um, subscribed to. Um, so Sinan Pasha as a former mathematician and astronomer is fully aware of the importance of precision in making necessary calculations, astronomical, astrological. However, for him, it is difficult to find in his time an erudite monadjim who can precisely calculate the celestial configurations and deduce their astrological indications um, uh, accurately. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. I <laughs> miscalculated my allotted time. Sorry about that. But let me just quickly go over some other examples. And these examples also show a greater variety in terms of the Sufi tariqas these individuals um, uh, had membership. And um, for instance, uh, Ibrahim Gülşeni has a particular episode about his debate with the Munejims, court Munejims in the service of Akko in the ruler uh, Yaqub. Uh, and there is one particular imagery used in the hagiography of Ibrahim Gülşeni written by uh, Muhyi uh, uh, uh, several decades later, the Usturlab ilahi. Uh, so one needs the divine astrolabe, not the type of astrolabe used by the monegians. Again, showing um, uh, how the, the types of expertise and uh, authority claims over epistemic um, matters um, are expressed um, with, um, with um, intriguing imagery in the case of Ibrahim Gülşeni. And again, um, um, Sheikh Ibn Isa Akesari, uh, who was a Bayrami Sheikh, who was famous for the Ilm al Jifr treatises he produced and circulated, also has really interesting things to say about the Munajjims and the Geomancers. Uh, for him, um, um, um, the princess should not spend time um, with uh, these kind of experts um, because what they say are nothing but nonsense and illusions. They are deprived of the real uh, essential divine gifts of Karama and Walaya. Um, um, and um, just to again uh, show the greater diversity of uh, remarks from different Sufi affiliated, um, Tariqa affiliated individuals, Lami Celebi, uh, uh, a later Nakshi, Nakshi Sheikh, uh, has a similar episode and has a similar remarks on um, the nonsense of the Munajjims. Even the same Lami Celebi spend a lot of time as he uh, expresses in his autobiographical account, learning astronomy um, and astronomical astronomical instruments. Um, uh, 
Um, and again, I mean, the examples can really be multiplied. Uh, and we have here an archival document that Tuna just referred to before I started uh, my presentation. Uh, we don't really know who wrote this petition, but it, it was written uh, clearly by a self-assertive Sufi Sheikh. We don't know his, uh, we can't really know his uh, Tariqa affiliation, but apparently he heard that Bayezid, Bayezid II um, was really interested in learning as the philosophical and occult sciences, and we have evidence for that, and I had written on this elsewhere, how uh, Bayezid uh, studied with a particular expert of the science of stars, Mirim Chelebi, mathematical and astronomical sciences. So this might be a reference to that. And this guy just says that, okay, you don't really need that kind of expertise. What you need is um, what I have. Um, and this petition really captures it nicely. And um, the, um, the, uh, the competition and rivalries between different experts also have other sort of dimensions or other, um, other, kind, uh, other uh, areas of expertise. Here, there is another petition found in, uh, in Topkapu Palace archives written by an anonymous geomancer. right? Uh, Dab, this was written by Remal Haidar, but I will turn to Professor Fleischer if he had seen this before. But in any case, at some point of the petition, again, he, uh, the geomancer himself, um, distinguishes his particular expertise from the expertise of the Munedjims and um, again, uh, uh, reproduces a similar discourse that uh, we can find in other um, texts uh, about about the Munedjims. I mean, uh, I will stop in a minute, but let me just finish by uh, saying a few things on, okay, I mean, there is this discourse produced about the Munedjims, and there are all sorts of attacks and negative remarks about them and their expertise, but what do they think of their expertise? And this is seldom revisited by the scholars, um, but Ottoman materials also, uh, in fact, present uh, really important insights into what the Munedjims thought of their own expertise. And, um, um, and in fact, Munedjims themselves were highly skeptical of their own expertise as well. I mean, they know the limits limitations of their craft. They know that um, there are infinite amount and permutations of celestial effects upon terrestrial um, realm, but there is no way for any human being to just study these or to really get to know these. Um, what we do is just based on experience and um, analog uh, analytical reasoning or the qiyas, uh, to make certain conjectures. And this is all we do when we practice uh, the astrological aspect of the science of the stars. Um, so when we um, um, discuss um, the entire discourse over the expertise of the Munedjims, we really also uh, let the Munedjims speak for themselves and uh, again, Ottoman materials provide us with um, um, with that. And on that note, I'll just uh, finish my presentation. Thank you so much for uh, your interest. Thank you, Tunj, for such a rich and uh, concise uh, presentation. We already have many questions, and I will ask the speakers in the order that I have seen the hands being raised. Um, I, I'm sorry to tell, let's try to be as brief as, as possible in our questions. And after three or four, let's see how we're going in time. And if we won't have time for all questions, I will ask you to put them in the chat box so we can collect them. Uh, Tunch will have them. We will all see them because we have two other speakers. And so, so the order I have seen, and I hope it is uh, going to be the order that they were raised, was Maria, Gunesh, Cornell, and Tuna. And let's begin with this. And Eleni and Harun, let's hope that there will be time for your questions. Uh, because now uh, we have about 10, 10, 10 minutes max. 
for the discussion. Thank I'll you. I'll be quick. <laughs> Maria. Maria. Very quickly, this is not a question, it's just an observation. Uh, the, the Ottoman context uh, kind of poses the same questions and offers the exact same answers that have been posed quite honestly since antiquity. The, the idea that astrology offers answers, but there's too much to know and therefore you are led to mistakes is uh, the earliest recorded instance, and I'm sure there are earlier such, uh, is in Ptolemy's Tetravivlos, the astrological work. And it is repeated in Abu Mashar's um, introduction to astrology in the mm. 9th century, which is an enormously popular text, both East and West. And um, it therefore, is, is, it, it, it's, it fully resonates with an entire tradition. And I think our, to me, as an outsider to Ottoman studies, part of what our questions, our, our large question of enchantment versus disenchantment and everything begs is the relationship between tradition and innovation. We need to be thinking about that because there are all these inheritances from an earlier tradition that are spun differently in individual historical contexts. And um, then there is more. I mean, for example, Munajim. What does Munajim mean? Uh, uh, contrary to how we like to think about things in modernity, astronomy was the byproduct of astrology since antiquity and into the 16th and 17th centuries. Astrology was how you paid the bills and you did astronomy to do better astrology. It is perfectly so also in Ptolemy's universe that all these people are reading. Quite honestly, I could go through your slides and tell you exactly in earlier sources in Greek and in Arabic where some of the same problems and some of the same answers recur. So we need to be thinking about tradition and innovation and how tradition is spun differently rather than what is the radical innovation at every moment in time. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I can't agree more with what you just said. And uh, I meant to uh, talk about that antique roots of that discussion. I just confined myself with the medieval Islamic world, but uh, the same discussion and the same arguments and the same um, issues can easily be found in, as you said, in antique sources. So there is nothing changed under the sun maybe. Uh, so that that is a problem to historicize this particular uh, uh, moment. Uh, and Not only this one, article. every moment, every yeah. moment. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why believe, I propose maybe we should just me, or, buddy, or uh, historicize Tunch knows that stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Ganesh. Well, this was exciting, Tunch. I have some minor suggestions for the initial part of your communication. Perhaps you have noticed Nurjan Abadjah's a bit old article on Ehli Vukuf but it was titled as Bilir Kishilik, but there's a very surprising thesis made in Adli Tip, Istanbul University's Adli Tip, on the Bilir Kishilik based on some 120 sigils and which departs on very, I think various uh, domains and about all the expertise, etc. This will Help me, uh, it's, I think the author is Sergian Aishan. You, you can easily find it out. But this will make me jump up a bit ex abrupto to Harun's uh, communication yesterday because it's all about the value as well. Uh, all the evaluation as well as value attribution depends on this Ehli Hebre, Ehli Vukuf, et cetera and the role of the Mohammi in the palace. Do you, have you seen notices of the Mohammi or not? I um, came across Mohammi not in um, Topkapı registers or documents, but in the Muhammis. In the Muhammi, Yeah, Muhammi, Muhammi is used as a special category mm. um, to make certain projections before a project. Uh, mm. Um, is um, is or when a, when a project was proposed, I, I, I, I encountered it. Yeah, fine because it, it, oh, it can be an excellent yeah. I don't know pist to follow this person, mm -hmm. which is which must be very exciting. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for brief using our time. Well, we have three more minutes and <laughs> three. No, okay, no. I will be very brief. We'll have a little bit more. I, I just want to say, Tronch, uh, thank you. You know, I think very well of your work. Uh, but what about, I mean, one thing that was missing from the communication, but might be there in a future publication or something, is what about the professionalization of these particular forms of expertise in an increasingly what urbanized and uh, commercialized place like Istanbul? Uh, I'm actually trying to, well, I'm not sure whether you are there, Ojam. Uh, Cornell? Um, why don't we take the next question and when Cornell comes back, will that be okay, Tunch? He's here. He's here. He's here. Yeah, he, I think he's here, but he just uh, muted himself, I believe, or... Uh, Cornell, can you hear us? I think as a host, I can unmute. Uh, I think I, I can hear you now. Okay, okay perfect. Right. Then. Go ahead, Tunch. Um, um, uh, <laughs> just to respond very briefly uh, just wonder wonder wonderful presentation i just wondered about i mean does some of this stuff the doubts about the monadjims proceed from you know the commercialization of astrology in a large city like istanbul where you can go to you know, you can go to the apothecary or you could go to the astrologer shop. Uh, I wish I had the documentation to uh, prove that. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, I'm more inclined to associating it with the professionalization you refer to. I mean, I'm trying to narrate the story within the Ottoman imperial formation mm -hmm. and professionalization and bureaucratization over the course of the 16th century. And we might even trace it back to the times of Bayezid II. I mean, the Ottoman administration of scientific expertise through distributing ranks, um, uh, creating- Yeah, articles. I know, it's amazing. All the earliest uh, documents and registers start from by as the second time about the chief physician's office, about the chief architect's office, about the chief monadjim's yeah, office. Yeah, you're right. Let me leave the terrain to Tuna, Eleni, and Harun. Let's go, Tuna. Thank you. I have many questions, but I'll just ask one of them. Thank you so much. Um, I have a quick question about Sinan Pasha. Do you get the sense that he was um, more concerned with the craft of the Munajim or their, uh, from his point of view, their lack of authority? I'm asking this because um, almost the only works that people are, at least in the 16th and 17th centuries, are fine with associating with Sheikh Wefa, Ibn Wefa are of a astronomical slash astrological nature, like Ruznami, Sheikh Wefa, which is basically a takvim. So I was wondering, I mean, of course, he might have different opinions than his Sheikh on the but I was wondering if he's more critical of their lack of authority to speak on this or write on the subject rather than what they were actually doing. Thank you. Some of his wording in that lengthy passage actually um, implied that he was more um, worried about how it was practiced in his time. Um, he wasn't really happy, as far as that wording is concerned, with the way that craft is uh, practiced by contemporary um, astral experts. But in other places of that lengthy chapter, you feel that while this is a more deeply rooted critique of Monajim. So it's somewhere in between, I should say. Thank you so much. Uh, Eleni? Yes, thank you, Tunch. Uh, question uh, about uh, Munajim Basha. So the chief uh, Munajim, uh, as far as I understand, he was somehow attached to the palace and uh, uh, so he was consulted 
on uh, special occasions or perhaps uh, every, every now and then, uh, more um, uh, commonly. Uh, this critique that uh, you told us about, does it influence the position of uh, uh, the, uh, this officer somehow? Uh, is there, I mean, uh, is there, despite crit uh, uh, critique, always a Munajim Basha there or not? And um, if, uh, um, so uh, to histo I, I would like, uh, since you, you uh, told us about historicizing, your effort to historicize this, uh, a bit to, uh, uh, ground this historicizing also to the reality of uh, there, as far as I know, and I may be mistaken, uh, the dynasty having and, and uh, the Sultan having always a Munajim Bashu or an astrologer, an official astrologer there, um, unless I'm mistaken. <laughs> You know, this is an excellent question. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, the numbers change um, in different times, but the office remained intact I mean, from the late 15th century on and up until the early 20th century. And well, actually, up until the uh, evolution of the empire, we have somebody holding the office. Um, but the numbers change, and the most dramatic change take place in the reign of Suleiman, for instance. I mean, Bayezid, Bayezid was so famous for his interest in astral sciences and uh, patronizing Munejims. We had six, seven um, uh, Munejims in the office, but then uh, through the end of Suleiman's reign, we only have two. And when we trace the available registers from his time, we see that other sorts of expertise was preferred by him rather than uh, the Munajim's own expertise. Uh, and the numbers also attest, the number of number of Munajim's patronized attest to, to that. But the office remained intact. And thank you, finally, Harun. Uh, and I can't see any other question from the attendees, but for all those you to see, there is a wonderful comment on Saruhani among the, in the Q&A chat box. Harun? Um, thank you, Tush. This was, you know, wonderful and satisfying as always. Um, you know, what you say about, you know, what Sinan Pasha says and, you know, what you relate, of course, reminds me of what Pico says about the astrologers. And in the European case, of course, um, Pico's attack preceded and not succeeded the golden age of astrology. You would say that, you know, it, astrologers really upped their game after, um, after that point on, not necessarily in response to Pico. And I guess in, in, in the Ottoman case, I'm wondering whether some later astrologers, and you would know them because you know all of them, um, would have satisfied Sinan Pasha. Like Sinan Pasha would say, okay, you know, this, this guy is okay. Like, I don't like astrologers, but this, can, this man can smack me in the mouth if he wants to. Uh, thank you, Harun. And Estafrul, I really don't know. Um, those Munedjims in the 17th or 18th centuries. And I would be really delighted if you can feed me in that direction. Uh, but um, um, Pico de Mirandola and Sinan Pasha connection is a really nice one. And, um, and you know, preceding um, um, uh, the good times of Munedjims then succeeding it is worth pursuing as a further argument. Um, I mean, thank you so much for that remark. Uh, but I really don't have anything else to add uh, other than your wonderful comment. Fantastic research, Tunch, as always. And thanks so much for being brief in the answers and thought provoking. Um, so now, uh, is there anything else you would like to say as the closing of your section? I think I already took so much of the time of our panel, so I should just stop saying anything further. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. So it is a, a pleasure to introduce another dear colleague and teammate, uh, Feray Joshkun from Özyen University. Uh, her ghost project on which she will present today is on Ottoman Ajaibs. Uh, 
working meticulously on numerous manuscripts and courageously uh, reading very bizarre texts, she's unearthing Ottoman conceptions of the Ajaib and Garaib piece by piece. And tonight we'll be listening to her paper, Wondrous and Strange in Ottoman Geographical Text. To you, Ferai. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you can see my slides, right? Perfect. Can you confirm me? And, and you hear me, okay. Um, let me just, yeah. Um, hello to everyone. Good evening and good afternoon. And um, it's also very honorable for me to be in this panel with Sunj and Professor Kafadar. Um, so my focus in our ERC project is the um, Ottoman geographical cosmographical source material dealing with Ajaib and Grealib phenomena composed mostly between 15 and 17 centuries, because these are the time frame that we, what we see is the composition or um, the composition of hybrid works or the translations uh, which deal with this phenomena. And, and mostly I deal with the Ottoman translations or adaptations of these famous uh, medieval cosmographies by, um, by Al-Tusi, Al-Kazvini, namely Ajaib al-Mahlukat, and also uh, the Haridat al-Ajaib that is attributed to Ibn al-Verdi. And also I'm dealing with the Ottoman hybrid works like Dudu Mekinol, and I'm also um, looking at some other Ottoman geographical material like the um, um, some other works dealing with the um, sailors uh, hearsay or the description of um, geographies pertaining to the Indian Ocean. So I'm trying to really um, combine different materials, but my focus is really on the Ottoman translations or adaptations of the uh, medieval cosmographies, which um, were written by these orders, just I mentioned. Okay, so while you you just um, look at this content uh, in my slides, I might begin my um, paper. Portraying the omnipotence and wisdom of God through the description of the cosmos, medieval Islamic cosmography tradition, profoundly influenced Ottoman geographical and cosmographical literature. Starting from the 14th century onwards, prominent examples of this literature were translated into Turkish and inspired various Ottoman individuals penned down similar works. They are also among the earliest extant source material shedding light on the Ottoman understanding of cosmos, it is origins and relation to mankind. By the term, Medieval Islamic cosmography here, I refer to corpus written by Muslims prior to modern era to describe the cosmos and both invisible and visible phenomena in the heavenly and terrestrial spheres based upon the Quran, prophetic tradition, Israeliyat, uh, and other cosmological concepts derived from various traditions as a result of cultural exchange between different uh, various communities along the history. These works dealt with topics such as angels, demons, planets, stars, countries, seas, islands. As you see in the slide, they, they really deal with a lot of, lots of topics. And, and in this regard, also some um, scholars classify them or, or describe them as the inventories of cosmos or simply natural encyclopedias. And some of these medieval cosmographies also included certain chapters on cosmogony or even eschatological matters. But I cannot say that these Ottoman translations um, got or translated certain parts on eschatology uh, or apocalyptic matters. So this is um, I, I notice in some works, which I can relate later on. And as I said, um, just just a second ago, these these three cosmographies were mostly um, translated for the Ottoman world, and and they were really. Um, became kind of a source material for many centuries to come. Um, and uh, it is not really certain who was the author of the Haridat al Ajay, but it is in the Ottoman text mostly related to uh, Ibn al Verdi. Uh, but um, although the El Tusi's cosmography was written before El Kazvini's Ajay al Mahlukat, so they, they wrote their cosmographies by the same name. What we know is that the um, cosmography by Al Kazvini um, received more attention and were translated um, many, many times into um, Turkish in along the many centuries. And yeah, and then that is why actually these works are named after this famous work of, of uh, Kazvini. So the, this corpus 
was mostly um, related to be the consisting of the genre of Ajab al Mahlukat, named after the um, cosmography of Kalasmini. While um, describing all this you know, cosmos, these visible, invisible phenomena um, in heavenly and terrestrial realms, they dwell also wondrous and strange aspects of, of creation and existence. And, and the main motive here seems to be to highlight God's omnipotence, magnificence, and wisdom behind his creation and also create astonishment, lead to kind of an astonishment, bafflement, perplexity, uh, and admiration of God's divinely ordered cosmos. And here, um, when we look at the what, what Ajaib and Garaib, all this stuff stand for, we can say in general, that, the, that they um, refer to objects or situations that causes astonishment, um, admiration, sometimes terror, sometimes disgust, sometimes fear. Uh, and so what you see here is the really interplay of a lot of mental and emotional um, categories or, or states. And also uh, what also I, I notice is that the ajaib things and garib things um, sometimes really overlap. So it's not really certain to say that, oh, this thing would be categorized as garib, this would be categorized as, as, as ajaib in every cosmography or in the um, Ottoman, um, Ottoman work. So sometimes you see that the same phenomenon might be considered garib or uh, ajaib, and what I see really big overlap. In modern scholarly literature, these works referring to Ajaib and Garaib are categorized as a genre of Ajaib or Ajaib al mahlukat as I said, as a reference to famous cosmography by al Kazvini. And um, Searing von Hess has problematized this classification, arguing that actually this kind of an, um, classification um, reducing the meaning of Ajaib and, and Garaib to encompass only fantastic entities. Because when um, these works are categorized under such a genre, there was a kind of an um, dismissive attitude uh, prevalent for these works, mainly by Gunabam or Ulman. So, and von has started to um, kind of an critical attitude towards this kind of conceptualization. And she saw it as a kind of an uh, um, conceptualization that is uh, associating this, so to speak, genre. Uh, with the Islamic decadence of scientific activity. And she started to really problematize this view. And as a challenge, um, she argued that both terms actually are were related to um, the real phenomena, mostly at least, she said, that not really fantastic or fictional phenomena. Um, and Persis Berlikam supported this argument by saying that Ajaib and Garaib mostly corresponded, corresponded to what really considered to be real by these people. And so, and so we should be really careful by denoting or questioning, you know, how much real or unreal, how much scientific or unscientific they were. So she said that actually we should not approach this phenomena with this kind of post enlightenment um, uh, binaries or, or, or polarities. So religious versus scientific or fantastic versus real. For, the Ottoman text for the um, elaboration of the Ottoman translations dealing with Ajaib and Garaib, also in the Ottoman hybrid works, um, we see that the same kind of a dismissive approach was also adopted by some scholars, so to speak, um, Adnan Adabar, Jabat, Hizki, Ramadan, Shishan, Ekbiletin, Isamolo. And um, they basically, um, in a way that imply that these works, in fact, um, implicate that they are the, they indicate that they are the representatives of a primitive stage of Ottoman geographical knowledge, feel bit misguided, unrealistic, fantastic and imaginary elements with no scientific value. So in a way they, by writing this way, they will really discourage people like me. <laughs> I wasn't discouraged, but you know, when I read these, you know, there is this kind of a tone of discouragement that these works had no scientific value. So it's like that they are not worth of studying. But luckily and uh, fortunately, um, this dismissive attitude was um, criticized by scholars like Minaikut, Gottfried Hagen, Persis Berlikam, and, and these scholars uh, underlined the importance of these works for the formation of the Ottoman worldview. 
And, and that is why um, lately many scholars in, in Turkey and outside of Turkey um, started to work on these manuscripts, different manuscripts. And we are trying to fleshing out their content, which is very rich content and which is very astonishing and interesting content. It's not really easy to deal with this content. And it's also really fantastic to, uh, to be in this uh, description, this way of description of cosmos. Yeah. Okay, so I guess you got a glimpse of the content of these cosmographies. Yeah, so these are my primary source materials for I'm dealing for our ERC project. I can tell that the, okay, more or less, I have done with this material, but I'm still working up with this half of the material as you see in this slides. Um, so my research is, is progressing. So um, hopefully in the next months, I might come up with some conclusions, but, um, I will be sharing with some only preliminary remarks with you in this um, presentation. When I look at the translations or adaptations, one, one striking thing which you might notice at the beginning of the uh, manuscripts that the authors, translators always make the remark that they compiled this, this um, knowledge, they wrote about the Ajayi and Gawai, or, or this, they compiled this work because um, they said that um, they wanted people to contemplate about the uh, about God and revere him. So you would come across with the usage of the terms like tafekkur a lot, contemplation, tafekkur and, and tazim. So you learn about the creation of God and so you, you revere him. And also in some cases that you would find some, some sentences saying that, okay, they have done this, they have compiled this to invoke fear of God in the reader's heart. So there is this, you know, a fear that is trying to be um, urged for the readers. Okay, so when you look at the contents, you would find um, various usages of the, you know, the Ajiba, Garib, Ajaiba, Ajaiblad, and this is the Ajaib in Dandish, you know, this is Minal Ajaib term that is translated from Arabic into Turkish, or you would find a lot of anecdotes entitled Untitled between the sections as Hikai to Garibe, Hikai to Ajibe. And these stories are mostly um, giving a kind of environmentalistic message, theological message. And you would come across with the um, verbs like Ta'ajibet Mek, Ajibe Kalibu, Tahayiro Mak, Ajib Temasha Komak. And uh, what really struck, uh, struck, what was really striking for me, what really struck my attention was that the, for the capacity of the by bygone civilizations, by the um, antiquity or medieval. Um, civilizations that do, what I see is that it is a jibe and garib um, terms um, used in pairs, probably um, is still a kind of a an rhyme. And mostly I see that the, um, they are used in a way to denote the, these buildings, these artifacts from the antiquity. Okay. And um, what I really, um, try to uh, understand about this content of these works, uh, that I'm working on some ideas, some ideas to play with. So on the one hand, I'm trying to understand that they have, they, uh, they are to uh, show the diversity of creation for the readers, how they are there to, you know, to point out the omnipotence or magnificence of the, of the divine, what is considered divine. And then the, um, how this phenomena is related to divine intervention, whether it is from a blessing or punishment, how they are related to lessons of morality or transgression boundaries. And also I'm trying to understand how the Ottoman texts inherited this, the ancient protosographical collections, uh, topology that's mentioned in these collections or medieval wonder collections through this medieval cosmographic tradition and what they added into this corpus. And I'm also trying to understand how, what kind of a picture there and how they relate to cultural encounters, um, whether there was this negative or positive marginalism, so to speak. And I'm also trying to think of the content through the certain arguments made by Carolyn Bynum or Sergings von Hess, and because they argued that maybe this content had this um, stimulus effect um, to, encourage people for further investigation. And so maybe they really served uh, as this function, the widening of the perception of people. 
Um, so there is this also question on, on, on, in my head, on the one side of my head. And also I'm trying to understand, you know, how this content teaches us about the, you know, how people perceive the relation between human and divine, dead, undead, mortal, immortal, self, other, familiar, unfamiliar, close, distant, visible, invisible, experienceable, inexperienceable. So I'm trying to, um, you know, playing with these teams while I'm looking at the content of my source material. And I'm also looking at these sort of mental and emotional states, which I have just um, wrote down here. And what I really um, noticed that, you know, which I would like to share with you tonight, is that the um, occasionally as astonishing, admirable, and terrifying aspects of existence qualified as wondrous or strange are accompanied by phrases, you know, sometimes it's Arabic phrases mostly, or, or certain verses from the Quran. Um, some of them are like Allahu Akbar, Wallahu Alam, or Turkish phrases like Allahum didi ulur hakte alan kudretina ajakti yildish. So you would see that there is an, a, you know, as I think defined there, pointed out there, then there is this, you know, kind of an extra um, claim or extra phrase. And I, I find really, find this, this um, sentences, hakte alan kudretina ajakti yildish, interesting because on the one hand, there is this motivation to make the readers astonish, audience astonish, but then there is also claim, you know, um, here and there that, okay, you know, you don't need to astonish because everything is in the hands and power of God. So there is also this kind of an implication in, in those uh, verbs I'm dealing with. And also what I find incredible is that the, I was expecting that the some really invisible and, and, and fantastic material that were located in the in the heavens, uh, you know, the, in the in the Felix or in or also in the in the paradise, in the hell, you know, more giant, more um, kind of and colorful, colorful illustrated, colorfully defined, uh, defined. But um, I haven't seen that clearly, really. For example, concerning the gigantic snake mentioned. Uh, in, in, for example, in Juju Meknum and in some other works, um, is not qualified as an Ajit thing. It's a gigantic thing, it has thousands of tongues, but you know, rather than, you know, a lot of animals or a lot of um, other um, plants or um, minerals, for example, um, defined in the uh, terrestrial realm are mostly um, related to the Ajit rather than the, um, the layers of hell or the layers of, of uh, heaven. And a lot of wondrous hybrid creatures, nations with strange customs, actually appear to be located in distant geographies. geographies. Of course, this is not um, that surprising that you would um, guess that the most of the islands in, uh, islands in the Indian Ocean, the Chinese Sea, would be quite good candidates to really point out the Ajaib and, and, and the interesting stuff. And, but the most wondrous and strange entities on the terrestrial realm seem to be actually in the islands of the encircling ocean. And, and that I find it's quite interesting. And, and what I see also the, in the island topology is that a lot of hybrid creatures, genes and demons, plants, animals, and minerals with bizarre peculiarities. But also a lot of animals in China were regarded or qualified this way, like the um, elephants or giraffes. And, and of course, dragons everywhere in China, in the in islands, always they came up with these stories, mostly with, together with Alexander. And the locals of these islands, not surprisingly, would be qualified as savage, cannibal, nude, uh, in, in re religious, non-compliant. And on the one hand, there is a kind of a criticism the way that they they live, and you know how, how strange they are, how you know um, how interesting they are. But on the other hand. That they are certain traditions are also considered a giant in a positive sense. You know, for example, for the island of the um, people of Bakwak, that um, there are also, you know, interesting stuff, but very um, bizarre stuff. But also, you know, if these people are so generous, they respect their elders. So there is this kind of an also uh, really praise for some um, people living in these um, interesting islands. Um, 
But this doesn't imply actually the most agile stuff were really located uh, far. Uh, because we also see a lot of interesting stuff in, in Mediterranean area, in, interesting stuff in the, uh, in the Ottoman realm, for example, in the nearby geographies of the orders of the audience we are relating here. Um, when I speak of distance, actually, you know, when I say far geographies, far um, or the close geographies, something I should also underline here is that, okay, what is sometimes distant might have some a giant stuff, yes, like this islands in the Indian Ocean, yes, with interesting stuff. Uh, but the distance here is not only peculiar to geography or the space, but also the time, distant in time, distant in culture. And in this regard, the um, talismans of Constantinople is a very, very good case to understand how they are also projected at Jari. Um, also, um, wonders are about enchanting one's own in our environment. And you will see, see the, you will see a lot of examples highlighting this in the marginal notes or by the translators themselves. And um, as I have um, worked in my MA thesis, I, um, I reveal that the Mahmoud bin, uh, Mahmoud Ahmed bin Khatib, uh, who translated the Haridat al Ajaib in the 16th century, um, added a lot of hearsay from his own time, from Ottoman Balkans. And sometimes he even inserted his own observations, um, innovated confirming that the, you know, there were miracles by saints and they were dragons being dragged by clouds to become the food of Og and Magog. And, He's, he was saying like, okay, you know, I have really heard about this, that this thing happened, someone saw it really. So it was really also interesting that to read these anecdotes, that the, to see that actually how people read or, you know, got from earlier cosmographies, uh, were, were also became a part of their own daily reality. I, I find it quite uh, interesting and such examples reveal that wonders were also part of their daily reality and, and they become like here and now, not in some distant place or some distant time. Okay, so just to give you some examples, Ali bin Abdurrahman's uh, translation, Tarjami Ajaib al which is the, actually the earliest text which you would um, study if you're dealing with the Ottoman translations. Um, so it starts with a very interesting claim that Ali bin Abdurrahman says that the, the one, one night I pray to God to pass away and I pray to God that he takes me to the heavens. So my prayers were accepted. I was ascended to heaven. I made a kind of an observation of, of all these um, heavens. And here uh, I am here today, you know, to, to write this work to tell you about the Ajayb of heaven. So he just projects his translation of al Kazvini's Ajayb Mahdukat is the kind of and his own observation of, of, the, of the heavens. So th this is so interesting. It was a kind of a reminder of the Mirat story or Ascension stories of Jesus. And Ahmed Bijan is a Jazadeh's translation, which is you know, the average translation of Ajayb Mahdukat is, is very copied and, and very uh, well received. It seems that way. And so in, in the marginal notes, I come across with interesting stuff. Um, while there is a kind of a reference to miraculous water in Iran, the readers wrote that, the, yeah, you know, we know this miraculous water, we brought it from Iran to Kastamonu to attract starlings and dispel locusts. So he basically says that, yeah, you know, this, this wonder, wondrous things works in our own environment, in our own daily life. Mahmoud bin Ahmed, as I just mentioned, talks about the dragons, talk about the saintly miracles. And interestingly, um, he talks about a black hairy monster in Hersek. And he says that this monster came into being that emerged um, as a kind of a divine punishment for the local people because um, there was a kind of an illicit sex action around this wealth. So, you know, because of this, to condemn this action, God sent this uh, monster to, to them. And when people approach the monster, when they observe the monster, they see the monster, um, it is said that they just you know, die, suddenly die. So what we see here is, uh, is that the, because of the humanly misdeeds or sins, humanly sins, then the, you know, this, this tough, this, this monsters, this 
um, uh, a drive thing, you know, it came into being. This is this example I find quite interesting and, and uh, very um, illustrative of how there were you know, varieties of uh, a drive. And I'm very sorry to interrupt. We you we have passed the twenty minutes. Uh, okay. Oh, just, okay, you're almost done. Okay, ju just just just one thing. Thank you. Okay, just one thing. So in Seyyid Ali days or Piaget's works, what I see is that the um, most of the ajayb were relating to omens and also the help of the Jalil Gaib and of, of course saints the miracles. And also we see that the same, this kind of um, material is being repeated in um, some other Ottoman works. So maybe I can um, elaborate more in the Q&A session. So thank you for your attention. Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, <laughs> no, no, I, I sometimes get too excited and get into the material and I, I just forgot the time, sorry. No, I was so yeah. sure you would add uh, and promptly. And so I thought that there will be other slides later. So my apologies. We have uh, two questions lined up. Uh, okay. First, Marino. Yeah. Uh, no, I was, you know that I'm very intrigued by the thing you also remarked in the last uh, section of your uh, excellent paper about uh, about miracles and marvels rather uh, localized in the Ottoman territories, actually in, in places well known and accessible. And I wonder if this is an Ottoman peculiarity in the history of Ajayip literature. And more, oh, uh, uh -huh. more particularly, a 16th, 15th and 16th century Ottoman peculiarity. Uh, we see some, I mean, you know, I'm obsessed with uh, this uh, collection of uh, Jinani, uh, which has mm -hmm. this about 70 uh, short descriptions of marvels, all uh, localized in, uh, in the Balkans, in Anatolia, uh, in Egypt, which is the most distant part. So uh, I have the impression that earlier cosmographers of the Ajayib uh, genre, uh, do not have this this element of, of uh, indigenous uh, marvel, so to speak. And I also have the impression that this uh, tends to disappear in the 17th century and beyond. I'm not sure because Evliya, Evliya is just, okay, uh, this is uh, the name that will uh, prove me wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if, if uh, Ajaib collections in the 17th uh, century continue to to to to, mm -hmm. to relate uh, marvel situated within the the empire, and mm -hmm. I would also like to, to add something about the, the, the ideas to play you you put uh, the emotional states. Uh, I don't know if this is relevant, but it might help you. It might help uh, also. Uh, I wonder if if you can see something like this. Uh, I studied some uh, literary, not only literary, actually, uh, hagiographical literary texts, uh, trying to see the supernatural uh, from the point of view of history of emotions. And uh, mm -hmm. with, for my sample, which was rather small, actually, uh, I kind of found out or suspected that uh, there is this transition, uh, okay, texts from the 16th century, for instance, uh, the, the emotion towards the strange, the marvelous, the supernatural, the preternatural, the emotion tends to be uh, the, the bewilderment, okay, Tajub, and so on. And in 18th century texts, in late 17th and 18th century texts, it's more, it's fear, terror, fear. Uh, so I, okay, uh, I, I made the suggestion to myself that, <laughs> that, uh, uh, when you fear the supernatural, this means that this is something you do not expect to, to encounter in everyday life. Mm -hmm. When you just admire it, it's something, okay, that is expected. It's, it's, it's marvelous, but okay, it happened to me, like uh, your geographer, cosmographer say. But when you fear, you, when you, you experience fear, mostly, terror, it's something that, that shouldn't be here. So I don't know if, if you see any, uh, any development towards the, the emotions displayed, or it's too early a stage of research to, to ask. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, Marinos, I'm still working on the material, so any example from 17th century or 18th century um, might might pop up um, concerning your remarks. Um, concerning uh, whether this was only Ottoman particularity, I, um, I just remembered that there was a kind of an work on the Urdu translation or, or the Persian translations of the Ajab Mahrikat of Kazvini, I should find that source uh, to you that in that source, I mean, certain articles working on that source, uh, they were also saying that the people um, made marginal notes about the uh, integrating the local um, marvels, wonders. And I can um, let you know about that particular source. And uh, concerning the 18th century, I know that there is one particular Ottoman manuscript which is um, recently published. Um, this was one of the latest translation of Ajab Mahdikat of Al-Kazwini. Uh, I think it was done by someone, Murtaza Efendi. I, I cannot remember the name right now, but what I know is that the, um, I've checked it. It's not a really long um, manuscript. And there was, there, there was this one particular example from the 18th century that um, uh, there is this um, cow coming to approaching the sultan and then the, he, he, it tries to give a kind of an um, sign to the sultan that whether he or she, whether he should do something or not. So this is taken as a kind of an omen and this is considered to be kind of an agile thing. I remember that this text was, was uh, translated in the 18th century in this particular example inserted there from the Ottoman time and it was 18th century. But I, I should come to you with the um, exact uh, notices, so I will do that. Thank you. So we're all, already over the allocated time, but we have questions and we will ask them. So may I again, I'm sorry, ask all, uh, all those who are asking the questions in Ferai to be brief and let's see how it will go. And if we need to, we'll cut it after a few questions and I will, you know, um, invite you in the order that the hands were raised. Uh, so it will be uh, Gunesh Gottfried uh, and hopefully Baki, Renault and Eleni. <laughs> and let's see. Thank you. So thank you, Ferai. Uh, I have rather an amateurish question and a remark, but I think this will enable you to achieve your communication as well. Considering this substantial corpus, do you observe an intellectual or quasi-epistemic dialogue with different societal milieu, uh, consumer, of, consumer of these texts? And in other words, you know, in the sense of Hans Robert Yaus, what was the horizons of expectation of the readers and the producer, producers of these texts? And a remark is about Kitab Bahriye and Kitab Muhit. Uh, I would just like to know how they fit into your uh, list of works. But mm -hmm. most probably they will serve you to achieve your communication. That's what. That's the reason of this question. Mm -hmm. I, I just um, normally, you know, I work on cosmographies and their um, reception and translation, uh, translations, but I also wanted to just look at them to see some par parallelities. But I actually could not find a lot of material that I can compare with the new material brought by the translators or readers into these cosmographies. So I just wanted to put them as a kind of a variety for, for that, so you can see what was really a giant for the uh, Ottoman 16th century individuals. Um, concerning your earlier question, I'm not sure if I understand it right, but you were talking that you were asking, I think, that what was the um, expectation of the readers, Ottoman audience readers? Um, yeah. Um, so what, what I really noticed that, you know, these works really copied a lot and, and, and they had illustrations, amazing, very nice illustrations and the world maps. And so it seems that, you know, um, they had this aesthetic, um, you know, they gave, gave, they provided a kind of an aesthetic pleasure for, for, for some readers, surely. And certain content related to um, plants and animals and, and the certain medical uses of the plants were, were, should be quite useful, even though the maps 
or the geography, geographical definitions are no longer valid, maybe, you know, because what we see is that they started to be, they co continue to be copied until 19th century, although in a dec decreasing manner, but, you know, they were still relevant for some audience. Um, what I really in find interesting is that, for example, Tashko Prasad in his Miftahu Sa'adid, he really praised Haridat al Ajayid's and his copies, and he, he said that this is so good for the edification of the soul. But what I know is that the Kaat of Chedevi criticized uh, Haridat al Ajayib. Uh, so, you know, so, so, some, you know, different members of Ulama took sometimes different approaches, and this sometimes really dependent on the time and, you know, in what context. Uh, so, um, this is what I can think of right now, but if I think of something else, I would get back to you. So, meanwhile, uh, there are also two questions came up in the Q&A, and so, uh, uh, may I just interrupt our panelists and, uh, you know, ask uh, these two questions very quickly, and then I will take Baki, Renault, and Eleni's questions, and maybe not to answer them, but we'll hear them, and hopefully we'll continue this discussions. And I don't know, Baki, how does that sound to you? Totally fine, no problem. Okay, perfect. So because I also wanted to give a chance for the attend other attendants. Uh, and Ferai, I think you can see the uh, mm -hmm. box, but I will, uh, great talk Ferai, writes Dimitris, do the translators of the cosmographies act mostly on behalf of themselves? Were there any of the translations commissioned by people outside the intellectual circles? I don't. Um, yes, I mean, sometimes they were made upon the um, request of the, of the princes or Ottoman sultans and the governors, for example. So this is um, said, and also um, Ahmed Bijan said that he made the translation of Ajab al upon the request of his sheikh, Hajibayram Bili. So sometimes you see that, you know, they, they explain it at the beginning, but um, concerning the Ali bin Abdul Rahman, for example, we don't see it, we don't see it. But the thing is that we have only one copy from 17th century. So maybe in the original copy that he also says that. And Sururi, uh, for example, um, um, started to make his translation upon the um, request, request of Prince Mustafa. Uh, but he, he just left it uh, unfinished when um, Prince Mustafa uh, passed away, and later on the same work was also taken up to be continued by Roda Sizade upon the request of, if I remember right, uh, Mehmet III or Murat III. I cannot, <laughs> I'm always confused with the, uh, you know, these uh, names of sultans, but, you know, what we know sultans even commissioned them princes, and, you know, the sheikhs, uh, and sometimes, you know, maybe they acted on themselves, but, um, yeah, this is so diverse. And the second question, I think there was. So you already read the question. Uh, thanking Günseli Gürel is thanking for the great talk and the complex working on the complex material. Uh, I was wondering whether and to what extent you see changes in the meanings and experience of wonder throughout the period that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, what I see is that the, um, I cannot really say that the people uh, were so convinced with the materials. Uh, transmitted by them, transmitted to them by the medieval cosmographies. Uh, sometimes, you know, I see that there was this kind of an, um, um, you know, um, uh, hesitation, like, you know, okay, the author or the author or the translator says, that, okay, we have heard about this, we are transmitting this knowledge, but, you know, God knows whether it is true or not. And this kind of an assertions are even evident in the 15th century, 16th century text as well. So I cannot really say that the, okay, people were so convinced with the content, but later on in the 17th century, 18th century started to change. I cannot really make it kind of a really clear demarcation related to the spirit of the age or the certain trends of the age. So I see such things even in the much earlier uh, material in the written in the 12th century, 13th century, even the Muslim scholars make this kind of an um, hesitations whether they should take the material. They have they they um, they are not that convinced, and they said sometimes that okay, uh, this is a jaya, but you know um, it, its content, its scope might change depending on the um, milieu or the time. So this is really something I should work on more and maybe I can come up with that kind of an 
solid conclusion. Excellent. So what I would ask uh, Bakir and Noah and Eleni to do is very quickly, if you could ask your question or if you can put it in the Q&A and Farai will you know, answer them in another context because it's already... I think I think a slick QA is not accessible to us, to panelists. Uh -huh. So we have to okay, yeah. raise the chat. Let us, let us raise the questions. Thank you. No, there is a chat we can use for this. Uh, uh, and that is also accessible, Marino. Ah, I, I'll, I'll skip then. I, I, I'll just write it on chat. Let's move. Uh, it's okay. okay. Uh, fantastic. If you can address to everybody. Eleni, would you like to ask the question? No, no, no, no. Leave it. Let's go on. It's um, okay. Okay. I, I'm it's very, not of importance. Very, especially on a talk and a discussion very dear to my to me. Uh, I'm hurrying us. Um, so Jamal is must be there now. Yes. Excellent. So it is an honor for me to introduce dear Jamal Kafadar. His writings, teachings, sohbets, and talks are always a great source of inspiration. Jamal has wonderful ways of inviting his readers and listeners to the worlds of the Ottomans. His titles announce exciting intellectual journals, like today. Uh, today, we will listen to Enchanted Celebis and their disenchantments, and I cannot wait. You are muted, Jamal. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Asli. I'm delighted that you finally have a chance to tell me to shut up. Uh, of course, real thanks. Let me get organized here. Go with go for Marinos. Thank you very much, Marinos. Thank you, colleagues at the Institute in Rethimnon. Thank you, the team of the Ghost Project. I've enjoyed every minute of it. The screen is not good for my eye and for my soul, but I've listened to every sentence that was uttered, including the questions and answers. And I'm grateful. I learned a lot and found it inspiring. Like all of my colleagues here, I have canceled or postponed many workshops and conferences in the last two years, and many moved online. Of them all, this is the only one I regret being unable to attend in person. I hope nobody takes offense, but this is the only one. An invitation in the summer of 1987 by the late Elizabeth Hanan, Elizabeth Zakhariadi, introduced me to Crete and enabled me and Gilru and Nevra, for those who know them, to spend a month in Crete. And then there were two visits on two different Halcyon days, Halcyon days, occasions. And Crete has never failed to enchant me. And I realize this usage of enchantment is not exactly what is invoked in the title of our conference, but mine is not an idle pun, as I hope to get to at the very end. I'm not a master of the 20-minute thing, and it's my record in terms of late lecture, so fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> I have to try and get it done. And also, thank you, Asli, for the title, but the title does not exactly reflect what I eventually ended up uh, settling uh, to do, but it is not irrelevant. Now, some of you know that I have been working on a book with Ahmed Kara Mustafa on what we have been calling vernacular Islam to study the ways in which Islam or various practices and various bodies of belief, lore, textual traditions, some of them steeped in learning and some of them not, identified with being Muslim, namely with living one's life as a Muslim, found themselves a place in the everyday lives of Turcophone populations of the lands of Rome in the late middle period. On the textual side, towards the end of the period we have chosen to investigate, before circa 1500, various cosmopolitan traditions were vernacularized, selectively, of course, and not always in fidelity to their originals, brought into one's horizon of recognition and expectation in one's language, that is Turkish for the communities we are studying, and in a cultural geography, lands of room, Turkish-speaking Muslims 
considered themselves a part of by then. A part of, if not their own, but not necessarily exclusive of the possibility of sharing it with others. In that sense, the 15th century was the heroic age of Western Turkish as a written language, which was deemed an appropriate vessel which was deemed an appropriate vessel for vernacularizing certain major figures and texts and traditions of the Hellenic, the biblical, the inner Asian August cosmopolitan traditions, not to mention the Perso-Islamic and the Arabo-Islamic ones. The highlights are major quasi-encyclopedic ventures, many of them voluminous works of the 15th century familiar to you, embodied in the Book of Alexander, the Book of Solomon, the Book of Abraham, the Book of August, the Tales of the Prophets, the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad, the Birth of the Prophet Muhammad, the Book of Hamza, the Book of Dedekortus, the Book of Qabus, and many others, and of course, the Book of Hizr, where Hizr is not the protagonist really, but sufficiently central to the structure and to the narrative itself to, I think, warrant that title that was given later, studied by Sibel Kojaer. Uh, very competently and, and very well. The authors of these works are mostly pre ilmiya intelligentsia, though some of them had a madrasa education like Ahmedi, but that's the sociological part of the authorship and, and, and the textual traditions that came to emerge in the 15th century in this new vernacular uh, that will be part of the book that we are working on. Our working title currently is The Age of Hazir. Since Hazir, our text suggests, occupied such a key place in and moved transversally across all of these narratives and many others and played diverse roles in people's everyday experiences, whether we think that those experiences were imagined or not. This, of course, is a philosophical enigma. You all know, but I just wanted to give you my characterization before I move on with the rest of the analysis. And some of it will overlap with uh, Dear Aslihan's Gürbüzer's, uh, in this case, uh, comment analysis. This is a philosophical enigma. One cannot be certain if he's a human being, a prophet, an angel, an immortal soul, Whoever and whatever he is, he regularly bends space-time and unexpectedly appears in or disappears from our lives, if not in and out of the world altogether, or different worlds that we may be inhabiting at different moments. He appears in the Quran, but not in name. I'll get to that. He appears in the Quran as the companion of Moses in some spectacular adventures, but he is also the companion of Alexander, for instance, to go back to the texts, the seminal, the canonical texts of the 15th century I talked about. He is also the companion of Alexander in his quest, Alexander's quest to conquer time. In popular lore, and not just of the Turks, of course, and not just the lands of Rome, Hazir is the ultimate helper to those in trouble, especially the Garib. But who is not a Garib in this world? But again, according to an unfathomable logic of his own, he is also the holy figure responsible for vegetation, his name meaning green in Arabic, and thus celebrated in the spring with various rituals or rapidly, of, of rapidly diminishing frequency and visibility since the latter part of the 20th century like the ayazmas of, or the Holy Spirits. It has been noted again and again that in those regions where Muslims and Orthodox Christians have historically commingled, Khazir is also conflated with St. George. Dabu the Kayseri, well known as the first Mudaris ever appointed to an Ottoman madrasa in the 1330s in Nicaea, wrote a good deal about Hizr. This is just one passage I will read uh, briefly. He says, the Gnostics at Arifun drank from the drink of love and the wine of reality, which is the water of true life. 
Hıdır, Hızır, upon whom we peace drank it, as did those who followed him in his station. The Gnostics became drunk from it, and it illuminated them inwardly and enlivened their hearts. Hızır thus plays a very important role in the way at least many intellectuals, many Sufis understood Gnosis and uh, the uh, accomplishments, if they could ever be had, of the perfect Sufi. He plays key roles, as it does, in, in the Shraki texts of Sufi Rati, in, in uh, uh, Ibn Arabi, and various others. Um, skip, skip. Uh, there is a certain historicity to the nature of the encounters with Hizr and changing interpretive takes on Hizr, which I am after. So far, mostly within that late middle period. But for the sake of this conference, I started looking beyond into the age of the Celebes. And I really uh, got lost, <laughs> to tell you the truth, but trying to find my way out of it. One of the best ways to speak about the changing uh, role of Hazard from, say, the 15th century to the 17th is, for one, to look at the magnificent volume of Hatti Tranke, the Gegnum in Kudr, Encounters with, or Encounter with Kudr, where one does see a uh, preponderance of texts that speak about encounters with Kudr in the 14th uh, in the 11th century too, but from, from, from our point of view, all the way into the very early 16th century. And then there is a decline, which confirms my own impression, and I did look into it in the meantime, of what's happening to the role or roles of Hıdır Hızır in post 16th century hagiographic history. He certainly doesn't uh, disappear, nor does he become unimportant, but it is uh, something of a change. Another kind of uh, measure I thought I could have was by using the archive catalog, Osmanlı Archive Catalog, as engram, which I have been doing with many different words. So the word Hızır, the word Hızır, the name Hızır appears 1,076 times between the Hijira years 950 and 1,000. You know, there are not many documents before this moment. It's not going to be a very really significant statistic to look at things before 900 Hijira. After 1,000, for, while for 50 years before the year 1,000, we have more than 1,000 uh, cases in which Hizr appears as a name. During the 11th century of the Hijra, it's only 540. And within that century, there are drops within each half century. Obviously, this is not engram, but it's in fact more confirming of our overall impressions because engram gives you occurrences, whereas these are absolute numbers. And considering the fact that there are by far more documents over time in the archives, especially after the year 950 Hijira, this is obviously going to be a more significant statistical observation of the occurrences of the name Hizir. By the way, looking up the name Hizir occurred to me when we were working on the Treasures of Knowledge book, because a Tufi is called Hayrettin Hizir. And then I started looking around, and I found many contemporaries of his, of his called Hızır, but also Hayrettin Hızır, like Barbaros, by the way, the captain. In any case, that's for the naming practices and the appearances of, or with, with Engram, over time, the later occurrences of Hızır are mostly in frozen toponyms, like the name of a wakf, 
rather than the name of an individual who is alive at the moment the document is drafted. Hence, over time, the declining numbers are even more significant that I indicated by my comments so far. Anyway, I want to jump to the age of the Chaledis, which is, of course, a very partial and perhaps even self-serving reference to the longer 17th century, which I have been using, with Husser playing a connecting tissue of sorts between the age of Husser and the age of Chaledis, but not a very neatly woven tissue yet to take encounters with and companionship of and reputations of various beliefs concerning Husser across the centuries is something that occurred to me during the last couple of months in the middle of all sorts of other things to do. So some uh, ruptures here in uh, the move, which I recognize is rather abrupt from, the, uh, from circa 1500 to longer 17th century, the age of the Chaledis. I have been enchanted by these characters and they, what they brought to Ottoman intellectual life, as I understand it, or to Ottoman cultural life in general, with, with of course, with, with some serious uh, interaction with changes in, in, in mm -hmm. social life, especially urban society. I recently wrote about the word Celebi in the newly published companion to early modern Istanbul. But before I speak to you about social picture, uh, let me establish why, but I go partial and self-serving, why I consider the Celebi so very important for a certain understanding of the 17th century. I see the most prominent representatives of Celebidic as being engaged in a new vernacularizing project, born of a new enchantment with a new cosmopolitan body of knowledge and learning that is of the early modern world. Now the title for the Celebis, uh, the, or the title Celebi, how did it figure into my uh, some of the distinct social types of early modern cities in the lands of rule, Celebi, Peshe, Hatun, Levant, Ashik, Aga, El Hajj, for instance, would not have been recognizable in the earlier centuries, even if some of this vocabulary is much older. At the same time, certain social types and designations, Ahi, Tula, Balı, Gazi, Abdal, and others, were losing their visibility and prominence, even if they did not become extinct. The vocabulary associated with the new urban setting was not always newly coined, but their designations evolved, and some of them underwent dramatic transformations. Celebi, for instance, from the Turkic Chalap, that's one of the etymologies, which I find to be the convincing one, from the Turkic Chalap, God, Lord, was used only for the male scions of top elite families, descendants of Jalaleddin Rumi, for instance, or the House of Osman, the Fenari Zardes, and the like, in the 14th and 15th centuries. By the 1400s, it had started to trickle down to those in scribal careers, and eventually to numerous, again male, representatives of middle classes associated with urbane qualities, cultivation, refinement, and distinguished skills of literacy numeracy and learning, but not necessarily associated with the madrasa, with the madrasa or religious sciences, not exclusive of those, but not necessarily associated with them. It is obvious that the desirability or characteristics associated with be being a Chelevi was infectious. In the 17th and 18th centuries, it was not uncommon for Christians and Jews to adopt the title with some pride and to be known by it with some esteem and social capital. The Celebes of these different backgrounds wedged open some secular space in the new social order, where their mutually conversant intellectual, scientific, and cultural pursuits found themselves a respectable place in a world of learning that was otherwise dominated by the graduates of religious institutions and sciences, including Christian 
and Jewish communities. The pursuits of Echelevi tended to be more secular in general, with a focus on sciences like geography and on literary genres like novellas of the everyday. Going back to early, I, I wish I could do this for the different languages of the different communities. I think it needs to be done. This itself needs to be, of course, developed, nuanced, uh, changed, whatever needs to be changed in it. But uh, I just want to remind you that Kiritsis uh, was given as the inspiration for the word, for the use of the word Celebi by Vitek when he was trying to uh, explain the title Kirishchi and Celebi for uh, Mehmed, who eventually became Mehmed I of Amasya. Uh, the title Celebi and its sociology can occupy us for hours. I just want to recite to you a couplet from uh, Kemal Peşazade, Çelebilikte beyin medhali yoktur nesebin, ilm ile muttasıf olan kişi olur Çelebi. Nesep, genealogy does not matter, matter, should not matter in the use of the title Çelebi, he says. It should be used only for those with ilm. Later in the 16th century, there's a fetva attributed to Ebu Sud, but sometimes also given as a opinion given by Hasan Kafi al-Akhisari that the title Celebi should not be used by those who had nesep and mal, genealogy and some means, but should only be used for those with ilm. And at the end of that fatwa, they note that also the Jews and Christians are, uh, have started to use the title Celebi and that it ought to stop. It doesn't, of course. And in the 17th century, we have Celebis like Eremia Celebi, uh, the famous Armenian intellectual. Or if you uh, remember the personal memoirs component of Kantemir's years in Istanbul, he writes of his music teachers, the musicians he worked with. And th that, that community includes several Celebis, including one Celebiko, a Jew. Over the course of the 17th and first half of the 18th centuries, we are dealing with increasing numbers of the use of the word Celebi and its eventual adjectivization. It becomes an adjective, and to this day, that one uh, is, of course, part of uh, current daily Turkish usage, polite, refined, educated. The word Levent, by the way, has a similar story moving from the category of a social, uh, from a social category to an adjective. Uh, not so very alive today, maybe, but of course, uh, all over Ottoman poetry, Levent and Levendane are used, like Celebi. For increasing numbers, we can also turn to data from Armenian communities. While there are no references to Celebis in colophons of the 15th, 16th centuries, the word appears starting, word appears in colophons starting in the first decade of the 17th century and multiplies. For students of Armenian history, the social conflict between Hojas and Celebis is one of the most distinctive aspects of the 17th century in uh, Armenian social life. Celebis are described as those representing the elites, commercial and or intellectual, of Istanbul, as opposed to the more provincial traditional elites known as Hojas. Uh, Armenian Celebis, like their Muslim counterparts, seem to have considered themselves as more urbane and refined. There is a certain democratization of the use of the word among Muslims as well, uh, increasing usage among uh, in the countryside, in different cities, and in, in, in uh, circles that technically are of the re'aya. And that may explain why it became less desirable for Istanbulites and other urban elites uh, after the middle of the 18th century. One more thing about Celebi. Looking at the biographical dictionaries of the 16th and 17th centuries, and I went through and listed them, and, uh, uh, developing statistics uh, from them. Those who are called Celebi, an increasing and diversifying group in those sources are often depicted as having excelled in this or that 
Fen or in Fununi Mutenebbi'a. In addition to, or sometimes rather than, Ulu. The evolving semantic range of these two ways of knowing and doing, namely Fen and Ilm, with overlaps and distinctions, is part of the continuing research agenda that keeps spawning and sprawling. And I'm sure many others uh, in the Ghost Project or others in our group have been uh, noticing the uh, significance of these usages and the changes over time, Fen and Ilm, uh, in, in uh, 17th century Fen, sometimes could be translated simply as arts and industries, but it is certainly not that simple. And uh, Mininsky gives ars industria scientia as uh, counterparts for, uh, for, for Fen, though the differences in this regard are also uh, there in the 16th and 17th century biographical dictionaries. Eventually, of course, in modern Turkish Fen, has come to uh, mean to designate the hard and natural sciences only. Those things that were not studied in the medrese uh, in the later secularizing uh, late 19th, early 20th century era. Back to Celebi Katip Celebi in particular. Katip Celebi starts the Mizan with Huzr. If we take the order of the book seriously, and we should, the question is why. He starts with a prologue, very important prologue, noted. And then when he gets into the Buhus, Bahisler, which Meninsky translates, uh, not doesn't translate, it gives Turkish counterparts as, uh, as uh, Niza, as uh, in uh, Latin, he gives disputatio, etc. So he divides his book into disputations, and he starts with Huzur. It's not just a question of why he starts with Huzur, but I just uh, would like to emphasize the fact that we sometimes speak about the Mizan al haq without full recognition of the burning questions that the context provided that the context presented to Katip Chelebi. Of course, Gottfried Hagen's biography does a very good job in placing, including his short biography in the Ottoman historian's uh, project that Hakan is editing, and my name is kindly listed. Uh, Gottfried's bi even short biography there puts the words in their context to the degree an encyclopedia piece can. But let me go over this. Uh, March 15, March 1656 is the Vak'ai which is less than a year after the rebellion of 1655. June 1656 is the blockade of the Dardanelles by the Venetians. September 1656, Köprülü comes to the Grand Vizier. October 1656, fight breaks out between the Kadazadiri and the Sufis uh, to the well-known story. Istuvani and associates are exiled to Cyprus. November 1656, Tufet ul-Kibar and Mizan al haq are written. Less than a year thereafter, Katip Celebi dies in October 1657. Heart attack. Man. Of course he would have a heart attack given all this. And given the fact that he was intellectually, spiritually, emotionally so invested in all this, he put his life work, some of it, some of the most significant uh, examples of his life work, Lebenswerk, into those months. By the way, can I do a short paparazzi this really comes from a margina marginal note in a 17th century manuscript. One twist to the story of his death, which we know was a heart attack. We were working on Atufi and the palace library a few years ago at the Topkapı Palace, and he met 
discover the past, this passage in the marginal note, my colleague in the Tashkir. It is, yeah, and according to it, Katip Chelebi, uh, it was a very hot day, Katip Chelebi woke up early in the morning, had intercourse with his wife, then ate some melon and drank a cup of coffee, or maybe more than a cup of coffee, and that seems to have been the big uh, gossip of the 17th century that got to be written down only in some marginal note in a manuscript, but that is Katip Celebi's uh, early and unfortunate demise in the October 1657. Let me return to the order of the Buhus by his lap. Meniti gives Diraya my text. Questio, scratio, scrutatio, disputatio, controversia, sual, mesele, chekish, niza. This is the stuff that the book is uh, organized around. Why start it with Huzir? Because it goes to the bottom of it all, concisely but directly. Namely, disputes regarding Huzir touch on many of the fundamental issues, concerns of the book. Even if they are not discussed directly, any of the fundamental concerns of the book, ontology, epistemology, prophetology, all of them manifest through specific debates regarding various disputed or controversial aspects of popular belief and practice in his lifetime. Beyond those specific debates, which he treats one by one, there are more abstract questions regarding certainty versus conjecture. What can be known with certainty and how? The interplay between reason and text as well as between custom and text. All of that coming into play in debates, like can Huzur still be alive, etc. That is perhaps why he's so stern on this matter, with no accommodation for custom. Unlike the rest of the Bahislav, unlike the rest of the disputations that he goes over. I find him to be very stern in dealing with the question of Huzur, and I'd like to hear, especially Aslihan, on this. I'd like to read the text together with her. That's, that would be best. Uh, remember the question, is Huzur a human being or not? Is he a prophet or not? Immortal or not? How can we know if an encounter with Huzur is indeed an encounter with Huzur? Can we know? What is the special ilm that God in the Quran says it gave from our side, God says, Ledinna ilman to Huzur. And the Gnostic, uh, what is the special ilm that God gave to Huzur and the Gnostic might be able to reach? Can anyone other than Huzur indeed reach it? The lore about him also raises the philosophical question of identity. Is he one or two? Who is Ilyas? with whom Huzur is often mentioned and de depicted in the same space. Huzur, Ilyas, Huzur, Elez. These are questions that long preceded Katip Celebi and the Ottomans altogether, but continue to be asked with waxing and waning intensity. Here, Katip Celebi is trying to give it his own definitive response. And I don't find him so definitive in all of the 16 chapters that follow. He outright rejects the possibility of immortality, as well as the possibility of encounters with those who are dead, or not of this world, like Huzur. Even if one were to consider Huzur, and Katip Celebi seems to do that just for the sake of the argument, even if one were to consider Huzur as one abstracted from humanity and incorporated into spirituality like Jesus Christ, Besheriyetten insilah, Encountering him would not be possible, just as one cannot encounter Jesus Christ before the day of judgment and the script of the end time. Only a select few, however, namely friends of God, might be able to experience this or something like this, but he underlines, not in a material or corporeal sense, Otherwise, it is a matter of yakiniyat, certainty by reason, which the hadith cited by Ibn Hajar is actually polemicizing against it. The uses, not Ibn Hajar himself, but the uses of Ibn Hajar al Askalani and Nazmi Efendi, who was cited uh, in the previous days, takes him to task for this. But for Katib Celebi, the hadith cited by Ibn Hajar 
cannot disprove any of the argument above, which is a matter of yakiniyat, of certainty. And he concludes, shek ile yakin zail olmaz. But the certain knowledge cannot be annulled with, uh, with uh, raising doubts. Tatip Çelebi does not even consider the question of ledinni ilm, or the Gnostic way of knowing, nor the Nubuwa or Vilaya of Hızır. He is really sparse in his discussion with Hızır, and one might even say ungenerous. However, one wishes to define it, Katip Çelebi's rationality is not Svek rationality here, and I'm sure everybody would agree so many things were said in that regard. He is saying something different from Vani Efendi, who treats the topic, topic of Hazrat through the account of his journey with Moses in his exegetical book, in the Vani Efendi's exegesis. The paramount question here is the possibility of Gnostic knowledge of the truth or knowledge from God. To Vani Efendi, this is perfectly possible so long as God grants it. In that sense, Hazrat had access to it and so could the Gnostics. In other words, Varni Efendi is being deferential to the exegetical tradition here and uh, does not uh, make trouble. I remember Barty saying a couple of days ago, was it that Birgivi and others were, Birgivi's works were not aimed at morality as such, but at consolidating a kind of rationality. And he made a very good argument for it. And I agree with, a kind of rationality. Yes, a kind of rationality, but different from that of Katip Celebi, for whom Nas, authoritative scripture, does not play the same role. Namely, we need to subject rationality, I wrote this before our earlier discussion, we need to subject rationality itself to a historicizing scrutiny beyond Zweck and Werk. The uses, the possibilities, and the limits of which have been articulated so well by colleagues in the last few days, Harun Kuchuk and Gottfried Hagen, for instance. It is preferable, at least for certain purposes, to think of rationality not as part of a binary, rationally rational, where rational itself is understood, rational itself is understood in a binary way, Zweck and Werk, or, or, or Werk, but as part of a set of attitudes, of a filled field of attendant positions, which provided a place and a meaning in the larger frame of things. And maybe I'm not talking of rationality, but of reason. What is the relationship between reason and or rationality and moderation, for instance? A mighty important one, according to Katip Chilevi, for whom the golden mean is a very important category of the right use of reason. Can an immoderate person be rational? Not according to Katip Chilevi, in my understanding of his thought. The problem with the Kadazadeli and Sivasi is not that they are irrational as such, but that they are engaged in ifrat and tefrit, the Kadazadeli in particular, actually uses this vocabulary, excess and exaggeration, which puts them beyond the category of reasonable in Kadazadeli's thinking. Another entry in that set of attitudes would be empiricism of a naturalizing sort. Evliya, but could one say about the Chelebis without mentioning it. Every Chelebi looks at something. All is fine am now. Am I cut? No. Am I, am here. I here? Am I with you? You are, we are with us. Let's. Hiz Hizr is bending space time. Every uh, is always looking for evidence to prove almost all his points, different kinds of evidence, of course and brings an autopsical or autoptic voice to his aid. I'm using autopsy in the sense of seeing for oneself in its etymological uh, origin sense. He wants to say if he can, even if he's making it up, he wants to say, I've been there and seen it myself, which is an attitude rapidly growing and infusing writings about other people and other lands since the 16th century at the expense sometimes of citing authoritative traditional sources. If we are maybe the most flamboyant representative of that autoptic voice, but he's not the only one. It even seeps into minutiae of the stately exegetical literature. Both Ebu Sud and Bani Efendi in their exegetical works 
writing about Gurutarnain in the Quran and discussing his identity, is it the Hellenic Alexander or a more ancient one? Ibn Kathir writes of two Alexanders, for instance, and considers the Quranic Gurutarnain as the first one who lived 2,000 years before Alexander of the Hellenes. So both Abu Sud and Wani Efendi in their exegetical works, the writing about Gurutarnain and discussing his identity, point out that they have seen Macedonia and its ancient ruins, presumably from the time of Alexander. Ebu Sud explicitly says that he was part of Suleiman's company on an expedition. This is in his tefsir. He was, and, and, and, and there are hardly any autobiographical passages in the tefsir. And uh, he just says that he was there and he saw Alexander, the ruins associated with the, with the age of Alexander. Um, so does Vani Efendi say, though he doesn't explain why he was there in Macedonia. The mundane world itself was offering itself in a new way, in a mundanely enchanting way. I don't want to use the word secular so easily and to lead to another discussion, but in a mundanely enchanting way. What transported Evliya to states of wonder, even ecstatic states of wonder, could be encounters with the preternatural, but could also be as mundane as musing on the fact, or what he thought was a fact, but based on solid material evidence, he argued, that the Black Sea was once the world's largest sea since he had seen with his own eyes some fossils of sea animals in the Kipchak steppe. Wow, man, imagine kind of attitude. Or this world is indeed a magical place kind of attitude. You would know if you've ever seen the skyscraper of a cypress tree in front of the mosque in Pochitiri. And imitating the voice of Evliya, which I hope gets through in these kinds of enchanting, mundanely enchanting encounters with the uh, mundane. I have a bit more to say, just skip, skip. Wonder and enchantment might also hit you when confronted with the mundane tales of ordinary folks. I'm thinking here of Eremia or Tifli. Neddah does not tell the story of a ruler or a hero or a larger than life figure anymore. They might be included in some of the Meddah's tales, but of folks you but, but Meddah now tells of folks you might run into. And their tales in their own way can be, of course, enchanting and edifying. Here my comparanda are really not necessarily in Europe, but in Japan and the Ukiyo literature, the scheming world literature, but that's another story. This is clearly, I would finish by saying, this is clearly enchantment of a different order and different, different teacher. But it is an enchantment nonetheless, and it needs to be taken into account in its own right, and that might enable us to understand something that was happening to the cultural world, folk worlds, mentalities, sensibilities, attitudes of folks in the longer 17th century. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jamal. Uh, so as a chair, actually, I'm in a very comfortable situation now because the conference ended <laughs> about an hour ago. Uh, so and it's I all realized that, so yeah. I could go on. Uh, and also, since this is Zoom, we won't be disturbed by people leaving or people can leave very easily. Um, so here we are. Uh, but of course, it's getting late. So Jamal, you'll have to let us know when you'll be tired from the questioning questions. <laughs> uh, and uh, let's begin. I haven't. Oh, here we go. Uh, OK, it will be the Before order. Before we begin, I need to read a note by Gottfried Hagen, which is my error here. Gottfried, thank you very much. He wrote to me personally, but um, I, I missed that, that the marginal note I mentioned about Katip Chilebi's death was uh, already there in Gottfried's book, which he also cite in which for which he cited some of the other works, but lost that detail. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Gottfried. Okay, we'll we'll take them as the in the order that they appeared, uh, Baki, Gunesh, and Gottfried 
uh, will be the first three. Hocam, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I have a very uh, short question and out of curiosity, the, the texts on Hudr that are much more or in the earlier period, uh, do they ever touch on the sort of the popular celebration of Hudr al Is there any, uh, uh, uh, the more popular memory that is every year, is that, is there any connection with in the in the literary uh, discussions and discourses with that, I imagine I imagine that popular memory was already there. In uh, but I don't know. Maybe it's a recreated tradition later on. Uh, I, I, I there is a 16th century miniature of Khidr and Ilyas. Well, not only one actually. There are several uh, of. Uzur and Ilyas together bringing spring or blessing the spring, blessing the vegetation of the spring. And people around them uh, seem to be celebrating. And for all sorts of reasons, I cannot think of any more specific examples to give you right now, but uh, I think the celebrations go back to go back to uh, at least this period when the Hizr texts are written uh, and uh, or texts in which Hizr appears in uh, key roles in important roles in multiple ways uh, are written and ultimately question of the spring rites in Byzantine society which I haven't explored. I just know about later uh, ethnographic and some uh, historical folkloric observations about conflations of the rights of Hudr with, uh, with, with the rights uh, of St. George, spring rights. One might be able to find much more in uh, Byzantine popular traditions. Jamal, there is a related, related question for the Ottomans, and you can see it also Q&A from Mariam Patton. Hojam, I was wondering, uh, so it's in, I was wondering if you could share a bit more about the kinds of sources that Hızır appears in, specifically in the archives. I ask because I've been on the hunt for reference to Ruz Hızır, but didn't think to reach for his name more generally. Um. kinds of sources that uh, Franke uses, Patrick Franke uses, are hagiographies, chronicles, and um, philosophical or Sufi discussions of the nature of Hazir or, or various questions regarding similar matters in which Hizr also comes into play. But in the archives, the name Hizr, actually Ruza Hizr appears a good deal. Uh, and I want to, in my statistical, in the ultimate statistical configuration or tabulation I have, uh, I'm hoping to exclude the kinds of usages that are not related to personal names of somebody alive at the moment the document is drawn. Thus, Ruza Huzur is one of the categories that ought to be excluded, I have noted, from, from my numbers. But for that reason, I know that Ruza Huzur appears. So, I mean, before Gunesh uh, Etunç sent the message, all, all of us can see it, and uh, Munajim's uh, often note in the takvims, the Ruza Huzur. But now, Ganesh, please. Dear Hojan, it was marvelous. I have a first a trivial remark on this famous 5th of, or 6th of May, related to Hazar, but as a race. So the Ottoman Navy always goes out at the 5th or 6th of May, without doubt, to, in reference to Hayrettin Hazar race. It's a it's rather, uh, I don't know, shaky 
hypothesis, but it is possible still. And uh, for the again for the sixth of May, etc., in Golden Bar of Fraser, we can find many and many uh, relevant material. But I have a very perhaps a nonsensical question. <laughs> this is, as you might guess. When I combined Hızır and Çelebi, we have a Hızır Çelebi, the first Kadı of Istanbul, etc. And it's, he's seemingly or allegedly uh, a grandson of Nasrettin Hoca. In this sense, would uh, Nasrettin Hoca, with all the ramifications of his anecdotes, be a prototype of the Çelebis in some manner or not, that's a, uh, I don't know. To me, he would be, but that would be a very cumbersome argument to make at this point. I, I think temperamentally, to me, the way I understand the Chilebis, there is uh, something there, uh, but it's, it's uh, not an easy and direct route one can make. To, to continue with this argument. But in terms of Hazir Chelebi's uh, ancestry, that, uh, that rumor or that uh, understanding of his family being uh, descendants of Nasrettin Hoca was certainly there at the time of Lami Chelebi, who mentions it in the early 16th century as what people say of Hızır and Sinan Paşa, Hızır Çelebi and Sinan Paşa. So it was around, and then İbrahim Atlı Konyalı has found a couple of uh, vakıf documents, which are not so directly relevant to this argument, but there is circumstantial evidence there that Konyalı tries to use to make the point, to verify this argument that uh, Hazır Çelebi is a descendant of Nasrettin Hoca. It might be, it might be. But in terms of Nasrettin Hoca, I mean, that's another iconic figure who is moving in and out of our conversations and our writings with Ahmet Kara Mustafa in his work. And there is something very interesting there, temperamentally speaking, uh, beyond the corpus of tales that he is bequeathed to, to later generations of Rumi. Okay, Gottfried, please. Eleni wants to say something, and then she, I, I, I think we lost her. But you, you are in charge. I'm here. Sorry, if I am, if I'm making any mistake in the order of the hands appear, please uh, jump right in and claim your hand. So I'm just like, uh, so I, so Gottfried and Harun now, Eleni, if you okay. want. So, th thank you, Jamal. This, this, this was, there was so much. To, to, to think about here. I just want to, want to say, I don't lay claims on discovering this um, uh, marginal note uh, about um, <clears throat> Kajib Tilibi's death either. It, it was already known to Orhan Shai Gökyay, except, except that Gökyay omitted the part about the sex. Because I think he did found, find this kind of disenchanting Kajib Tilibi, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And I wanted to quickly say, say uh, to to to to to Ganesh, um, this the the the the solar year after all is divided with Ruzi Qasim and Ruzi Hazar into two equal half years, and that is sort of the Ottoman campaign year, right. and it corresponds to Saint George and Saint Demetrius days in the Greek calendar. So I don't think there is a connection here, but. I, I have I have a question for you, Jamal, um, that, that sort of intrigues me because I, I was fascinated by by your reading of this this one Katib Chilibi chapter. And I was I'm, I'm really wondering, there is a the, the other chapter uh, that's so controversial that it was actually left out of the the the printed edition by by Abu Ziyaf and the the chapter about the parents of the prophet, um, <clears throat> and I, I wonder this this looks so thoroughly sort of a disenchanting move right to dispute uh, to to to to posit or at least intimate that the parents of the prophets might not have been muslims 
Yeah, this this this idea that. <clears throat> but on the other end, is it or is the the idea that prophethood is not in some way sort of just or also continuity of of of sacredness, but sort of comes out of the blue. Um, oh. Is that also a disenchantment? I, I'm I'm really wondering how you think about that. <clears throat> In that respect, I think I see him following Do you hear me well? I should have done this one hour ago. <laughs> okay. Um, I think he's following a um, kind of tradition, a robust tradition in its own right, that uh, the prophet Muhammad is, uh, like other prophets actually, just a human being where Nesep does not matter at all. So ultimately, of course, the Qureshi Nesep is going to matter for later history, for, for the history of Muslims as such. Uh, but uh, that, that you know, obviously one shouldn't say anything to hurt the soft spot in the hearts of Muslims about the parents of the, uh, of the prophet, but without offending the sensibilities of uh, such sensitive Muslims, one should recognize that, that the parents were born, you know, at the time when the revelation had not come down to the prophet. And um, I think in that he's not being so controversial to me or he's, be, he's not being so abrupt or stern or difficult or ungenerous. But, but some people were really furious about this notion. I mean, if you look at um, Nazmi Chele before, uh, uh, F, F, F, sorry. <laughs> so, so, so, so Nazmi Effendi, for instance, is furious about yeah. the, the, this this idea, <laughs> right? So so so for some it was really sacrilegious. Yeah, including the you know the, the Katib Chelibi's objections to Ibn Hajar Askelani uh, and all that. So <laughs> even considering the question, he offended the sensibilities of some people with not giving a straightforward answer or not giving a direct answer that they would like to have heard. Yes, I understand, but I find him following a, following a tradition that is quite well established uh, in this regard. Whereas with Hazir, even compared to Vani Efendi, for instance, I think Katip Celebi is totally non-generous. Is Aslahan still with us, Gürbüzel? No, she's not. I also ah, okay. give her. Um, I'm here. I'm she read oh, it. Oh, yeah. hey. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I I haven't read the uh, the part about the prophet's parents from Katib Chelibi recently, um, so it's hard for me to answer. Um, but what's at stake to say the prophet's parents are unbelievers? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm just going to say I agree with my hoja because I haven't read the chapter <laughs> chapter <laughs> in a long time. But my reading of that was based on Abdul Ahad Nuri, um, who, who, whose interpretation is not disenchanted at all. It was about the possibility of salvation despite having not um, done the necessary acts of Islam. Um, so in that sense, it seemed to me to be opposite of, um, of uh, disenchanting Gottfried. But again, this is tentative because I haven't visited his versions recently. Thank you. Shall we continue with Harun and Eleni? And I'm receiving messages that we'll need to wrap up uh, after these two questions. And uh, so, Harun. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, I guess I, I want to ask you, you know, in connection to things that you know, Professor Mavrudi has been saying about the historicity of reason. 
Um, and, you know, the historicity of reason, uh, in a way, and uh, Professor Mavrudi has, has, you know, associated with Descartes, the, namely the notion that reason can be improved, right? That's, that's the historical bit, like you get an education and that somehow improves your reasoning. Um, and uh, this is not a, you know, novel idea. This is not novel to Descartes, I guess. But what is novel, of course, is that, you know, we have been or people have been training generations after generations of people to improve their reason. And in a way, it seems to me that, you know, Katip Chelevi, for example, was a proponent of improving one's reasoning. So, you know, I'm thinking of the famous, um, the kadu who knows geometry and the kadu who doesn't know geometry, right? So there is definitely a difference there. And, um, and again, on Professor Mavrudi's point, I mean, yes, there are some people who live philosophy as a lifestyle, but for the vast majority of people who are exposed to philosophy, it's just something that you study in school and it guides you to right thinking about certain things. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm just wondering about, you know, what you think about that, you know, how that would fit into your idea of the, the historicity of reason and rationalism. Yeah. That's a very good, very big question. Uh, even with the possibility of uh, education helping one improve one's use of reason, um, I would think that Katip Chilibi and many others of his time and many other Ottoman intellectual elites might find it possible for some, but not for all. So when we talk about education and its uh, capacity to improve our use of reason, I think we should also ask a second question. Is this for everyone or is this for those who can, those the Havas rather than the Avam? And I would imagine that many of them would think, including Katip Chelebi, it's for the Havas. So while saying it, I'm, it could happen in different degrees or something. This is really a question I, I need to think about and a very good one. And I imagine, you know, I, I am not puzzled about what I said. It could happen in varying degrees for the Havas and Awam, but I think it's possible for everyone. Um, Yes, that is exactly why you needed to have certain types of books and certain types of education, even for the general public. And uh, it's, uh, it's a question, you know, Tariq Abu Hussein uh, is about to finish his dissertation on pedagogical thinking and pedagogical strategies in the 16th century, mostly in in Damascus and in Istanbul, according to some texts written by, uh, by Zarnuji above all, comments on him, translations of his work, and another tradition represented by, by the Syrian school of thought on this. And uh, I, I, I, I, I get the impression from, from his chapters so far that uh, there's much more to pedagogical thinking than I ever realized, and I think is there in, in, our, uh, in our secondary literature so far, and that it does have a, it does have a uh, push for pushing the human capacity to be better, to improve oneself through education. But, you know, in that simple sentence, it sounds too de democratic and modern, and that certainly is not going to be the picture. But whether our own modern understandings of education are really that as democratic as we think they may be is yet another question. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. And the last question, Eleni, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's not a question, but uh, it, uh, I was trying to find a reference to uh, the Hezer Elias and uh, the, uh, so to contribute to, uh, to this discussion that the, I see that is uh, uh, going on also in, in the chat. So um, uh, perhaps the earliest reference 
uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, is uh, uh, in uh, the work of Cantacuzinos, Lanis Cantacuzinos, Contra Sectam Mahometicam Apologie. And uh, so it's uh, 14th century already. And uh, he says that uh, uh, he, he says that uh, the Muslims also um, um, venerate uh, St. George, whom they call Heter Elias. Heter Elias. So uh, it's uh, uh, probably something that. Uh, I mean, if it's uh, already in the uh, in the in the mid fourteenth century in the Balkans, then I suppose it has originated somewhere in Anatolia, came over. And uh, the other thing that uh, it's uh, very prominent, uh, so Saint George and Greenness uh, in the Slavic tradition. This is the. Of course, the, the two dates are uh, very important, no, not only in the Ottoman context for um, campaigns and for paying uh, for, for mm -hmm. payments, and uh, in uh, also uh, in contracts uh, for uh, of every kind, uh, but also for uh, the transhumant. Uh, um, tr uh, migration, uh, transhumant uh, movements uh, among the Vlachs, first of all, like the Aromunian populations. And uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, especially St. George and Green, Green George uh, uh, is a figure um, in, in the Slavic uh, folklore in the Balkans. So just a couple of. Thank you. And, and just before maybe Jamal comments on it, a, a fascinating discussion is going on in the chat box. And Jamal, since you can't have the time to read, I'm copying it for you, but I'm sure all attendees and panelists are um, following it because uh, when the Zoom is over, it will not be um, there anymore. Um, in it, fact, Renaud Soler's comment, I, the discussion in Katip Celebi about the prophets, the faith of the prophet's parents is amalgamated with a discussion of Abu Hanifa. Kat, maybe that's what you yes, also exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. Right. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, so maybe the last message from everybody was from Harun, <laughs> reminding us uh, of uh, the duties that are expecting um, us. Uh, and it's almost 12, Jamal. Maybe we should <laughs> go for 20 more minutes. Too. But uh, so um, I would like to thank uh, Tunj, Ferai, and Jamal for wonderful papers and all the, uh, all the discussion, those fantastic questions. And uh, it's to you, Marino, to end today. And thank you all. Okay, <laughs> thank you all for another fascinating and long day. Uh, I just wish, I mean, we could we would normally continue over a glass of wine or two. And that's, that's really a pity. Uh, tomorrow, I, I promise I will bring uh, wine or some beer here in the office or to, uh, as to, to have some uh, of this illusion. Uh, so thank you all. And uh, we'll start again tomorrow at you know, six local time. I don't know if you can translate to everybody. We'll be sharp because uh, the first speaker, Sideh, uh, has again a parentage uh, problem to solve. So she has, uh, she has to be sharp in uh, six because somebody has to keep her, uh, her son or something. Uh, so see you all tomorrow. Uh, have a nice rest. And thank you. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.